open the meeting. Yep, you are open now. Right. Um, good evening and welcome. I'm Jean McKnight, Planning Board Chair. This open meeting of the Needham Planning Board is being conducted remotely, consistent with current state regulations, and is being recorded. Public access to this meeting does not ensure that there will be public participation unless required by law. This meeting will have public participation in connection with the public hearing, um, major project site plan, um, special permit for the property at um, 40, excuse me, property at 32 Chestnut Street in Needham. Um, so um, that is scared. that public hearing is scheduled for 720 and it's in connection with that that we will have uh, public participation. And um, as the time approaches, I will introduce um, the individuals who will be presenting on behalf of the applicants <laughs> do that. for that um, meeting, okay. for that hearing. Um, and um, so um, first we'll confirm that a quorum of the members of the planning board are present. When I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Martin Jacobs. Here. Paul Alpert. Here. Um, actually, I'm not seeing, um, Adam Block. Oh, there he is. His, he's got a photo up. Um, Adam Block. Present. Okay. Natasha, there you are. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> I must admit, for a while I was looking for Ted Owens. <laughs> Nat Natasha Expata. Here. Okay, so um, next I'll introduce planning department and other town staff. Um, so our Director of Planning and Community Development, Lee Newman. Here. Um, Assistant Planner, Alexandra Klee. Here. And uh, Planning uh, Department staff, Clay Hutchinson. Is, is present um, to help us with our uh, technical assistance. Um, so um, I, I do want to mention um, for those participating in the meeting, uh, please be aware that others may be able to see and hear you. Anything that you share or state will be a matter of public record. And all supporting materials for this meeting, including the agenda, are available on the town's website, www.needhamma.gov, unless otherwise noted. And the ground rules for this meeting are designed to allow for an accurate public record. Each of the speakers on our agenda will be introduced. After speakers conclude their remarks, each board member will be asked by name for any comment, questions, or motions. Um, during the public hearing, um, if there are members of the public uh, who wish to be recognized to speak, we'll ask them to introduce themselves and give their, uh, their residential address. Um, and all votes will be by roll call. Now there are two motions that we've uh, done during this uh, time of Zoom meetings, just to make sure we're all set if any technical difficulties arise. Um, and first it would be a motion to continue if we, if we, and we have not had this happen during all this year or more of Zoom, um, but it's just a precaution. And, and um, Lee Newman, should I use a June 1 continuation date? Yes, all right. Um, so first it's a motion to continue, uh, somebody would make to continue to this meeting if technical difficulties arise that uh, prevent us from continuing uh, the meeting or, it's, or the hearing within it. And that will be continued to June 1, 2021, also at 7.15 p.m. We also um, like to have a motion in place just in case the chair has technical difficulties 
Um, and uh, then automatically the vice chair will assume the role of chair for the meeting. Um, so do I have uh, those motions? You have those so motions moved. so moved. Okay, so those uh, motions have been moved and seconded and I'll call for the roll call vote. Uh, Martin Jacobs. Aye. Paul Alpert. Aye. Natasha Espada. Aye. Adam Block. Aye. And the chair is aye. So we have that in all set for our meeting. So the first uh, thing on our agenda is um, an approval not required plan um, applied for, uh, um, in other words, the applicant has applied for a determination that subdivision approval is not required. Um, the applicant is Robert Roach of Oak Crest Builders and the property is located at 71 Pilgrim Road, uh, Needham, Mass. Um, I, on the list of panelists that was put together, oh yes, I do have them listed. So the persons I have listed, um, if they are here, would they say uh, yes or here? Um, uh, Bob Roach, the applicant. Here. Okay. And Paul Bellew of Field Resources, um, the surveyor. Here. All right. Um, those are the only two uh, speaking on this. Um, so uh, we have the application. Um, we have a copy of the plan. Um, Lee, Lee Newman, I know you've reviewed this carefully. Is there anything you want to say uh, about this application and the plan? Muted, Lee. Muted. You're still muted, Lee. Sorry about that. Um, yes, I've reviewed the plan and, and the engineering department has reviewed the plans and we have no issues with it. Um, I think they actually intend to demolish the um, remainder lot. Uh, the house, I think that sits on the, on the remainder lot. It was my understanding that it hadn't been de demolished at the time that the plan was filed. Um, and the lot is, and the structure on that lot is conforming in all respects with the exception of a side yard. Um, um, but that, that side yard is not being modified as a function of this re-subdivision. So it's an, entitled to an 81P uh, endorsement because the lot has a required frontage on a way, um, um, which is a public way. Okay. And um, do, um, does the, um, does Mr. Mr. Roach or Mr. Bellew uh, wish to say, uh, I assume, Okay, I uh, uh, wish to um, say anything about the, uh, the lot and parcel rearrangement that's happening with this ANR plan. Well, yes, um, thank you, Jean. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, it's pretty straightforward. Um, unfortunately, there's a monument on the street that was in the past held to be a corner of a parcel that it doesn't act actually represent. So it led to the existing houses being built seven feet to the right of where they should have been. And so to correct that, the first step in that process is this a &R that you see before you creating two conforming lots um, for 65 and 71 and a parcel A that's a non-buildable parcel that will then be conveyed as the two lots to the left of us come forward later with a similar subsequent plan correction to help put everybody in a position where they're using land that they own. Um, so it's pretty straightforward at the end of the day, but it's in the purpose to correct a misconception that happened at some time in the, well, quite distant past. I mean, distant enough that the four houses that we're talking about, 65, 71, and the two to the left, um, all were constructed um, a little bit too far to the right. Um, right, uh, 
perhaps other planning board members will have questions, but if I may, um, parcel A, is parcel A going to be conveyed to the owner of the lot that's indicated on in the plan is James F. and Claire M. Scully? That is the intention, so ultimately. Um, okay. that, that's going to make them whole. As you can see, their pool currently sits on that, their pool patio. Yes. And so to, in an effort, again, um, Bob Roach, the applicant, the owner of these two parcels, in an attempt to uh, move forward with his project is also trying to uh, alleviate, which is a uh, unfortunate pressure on this entire neighborhood. Which so the owners of that lot, uh, the owners named Scully, may be back before us with a plan to consolidate. There will subsequently be a, I mean, it, there's coming a plan that's going to be the Scullys and their neighbor that will do a similar process to this, other than it'll mm -hmm. incorporate parcel A with the two lots that they have and then clean up the line between them as well. So that at the end of the day, uh, all things being equal, we'll end up with four parcels at, with, that everybody's using what they own. Um, these two right. end up being a little easier because the houses are coming down. I believe actually 65 has come down as well already um, in the interim between submission and today. Um, but that being yeah, the easier of the aspects is we don't have houses on these two lots. The other two are people living in their homes that we want to help them correct what can lead to uh, a lot of drama, as we all know. All right. Um, thank you for that explanation. And um, do um, planning board members have um, any question? Oh, a comment I, on this? Um, I do not request either do right I. if uh, if there is no uh, question or comment um then we could entertain a motion uh to end uh, to endorse the plan as presented um subdivision approval not required so moved. Moved. second we have a motion and a second to endorse um this plan uh, presented here tonight um uh, as subdivision approval not required. Um, so I call for a vote. Um, Mr. Jacobs. Aye. Mr. Alpert. Aye. Mr. Mrs. Bada. Aye. Uh, Mr. Block. You are muted, Adam. Aye. I apologize, Madam Chair. And the chair is I, uh, so we've taken care of that and we'll make arrangements for the appropriate signatures. Thanks, Jane. And oh, uh, congratulations on your matriculation from the chair. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I'm looking forward to, uh, to that, thank you. All right. Um, so uh, now it, it's time to open um, the public hearing. Um, and what we usually have a motion to waive the reading of the notice. Do I have? Jean, I think you're one or two minutes early. Can we just wait a minute or oh. two? Oh, um, no, it's, the public hearing said 720. Oh, 720, my mistake, sorry. Yeah. I, I'll, I'll move to waive the reading of the public notice. Second. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. Call for a vote. Um, Mr. Jacobs. Aye. Mr. Albert. Aye. Mrs. Bada. Aye. Mr. Block. Aye. And the chair is aye. So uh, the reading of the notice is waived. Um, and uh, so I will introduce those who are going to um, present um, this uh, pr proposed new use for this property. Um, and uh, those uh, people are uh, the attorney for the applicant, uh, George Junta Jr. Present. Um, and the applicant, Catherine Pennington Klein, DMD. Present. 
then uh, the architect for the project, Kenneth Fail. Present. Yes. Um, and the owner of the property at uh, 32 Chestnut Street, Alfred Graymont. And he is present, although he, he is muted uh, since she said present. Um, all right, so um, that, it, that's the group. And so uh, please go ahead with your presentation. Okay, thank you, Jean. Uh, <clears throat> uh, as indicated, this is an application for property at 32 Chestnut Street. This is uh, about, 1,751 square feet of existing commercial space in what has at different part, points over the years been referred to as the Jacobs Block uh, in the center business district right at the top of Chestnut Street. Uh, this space was previously occupied by the Art Emporium, which was a custom framing and art supply store. The building of which this space is a part was originally built in 1926. And then in 2002, Mr. Graymont uh, put an addition on the end of the building, the opposite end of the building, a two-story addition. Now, as a part of that, he went before the planning board and received multiple special permits. And that's actually, as I'll get into in a bit, why we're here this evening. So uh, the proposal is to renovate this uh, 1700 and change square foot space to be used as an orthodontics office uh, by Dr. Klein. Uh, if I'm sure you've all read my letter, so you know she's a board certified specialist in orthodontics with some considerable accomplishments. She's currently a faculty member in oral and maxillofacial surgery department at Harvard Dental School, Mass General, and co director of the Ortho Orthonathic, uh, the, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but Orthonathic surgical team at Mass General, as well as a member of the cleft lip and palate team at both Mass General and Shriners Hospital for Children. Uh, so she wants to open a small practice uh, here in Needham. The office would run generally from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Monday through Friday with some office hours on Saturdays depending upon demand. The patients would range in age from as young as maybe seven years old to possibly as old as 80. Although the really the core demographic uh, that Dr. Klein intends or expects to serve will be probably in the 10 to 12 year bracket. Uh, with that, as you might expect, she expects that she'll be doing an awful lot of braces, Invisalign, retainers, as well as some tooth bleaching. Now, there is likely to be three staff at any given time at the facility or at the office, uh, which would be Dr. Klein, one administrative person, and one clinical assistant. Now, the use itself uh, falls within the craft consumer professional or commercial service establishment dealing directly with the general public. And we did have a discussion uh, not that long ago about this whole issue. Uh, and the board did seem to agree that that is the category. Uh, and that coincidentally is the category that's been applied by the Board of Appeals as well as the building inspector. So under that category, a, a small dental practice like this with just one dentist is a use that's allowed by right in the center business district. However, as I mentioned, because of the existing special permits on the building from the addition that was put on in 2002, any change of the uses from the uses listed in that decision require further review from the board. So that's the main reason why we are before you this evening. We're looking for further review under the existing site plan special permit. Now, as a part of that, we also need some additional review, some additional relief in terms of parking. The existing parking waiver under that decision is for 46 parking spaces. And that is because there is no parking whatsoever on site. Some board members may recall that back uh, around 2000, uh, 2002, just prior to Mr. Graymont building the addition, he entered into an agreement with the town of Needham whereby he basically ceded over the use of a little bit of his land to incorporate into the Lincoln Street parking lot. So land that could have ostensibly been used for parking for this building has now been incorporated into the Lincoln Street lot and is now accessible and usable by the general public as a part of that lot. So there's an existing waiver for 46 parking spaces. Uh, the, the calculation is in my letter to you, but basically with the change from retail to a dental office, 
under the bylaw, the calculation results in a net increase of only three parking spaces. So we now need a revised or additional parking waiver from 46 up to 49 spaces. And that is for the entire building. Now the, uh, the site, the building is fully developed. The uh, changes to the space are, are not anything that will in any way change the existing interface with public infrastructure. So we feel that it meets all the criteria for a site plan special permit. And with respect to the exterior changes, uh, if you've reviewed the plans, you'll have noted that there are a number of different things going on, although uh, they're sort of in the, they make a big impact, but, but they're not major in terms of like rebuilding the building. So in particular, one of the no most notable things is the existing green awnings would be removed and new, um, and basically no awnings in its place, except over the front entrance door, which is on the corner, and then the rear sort of employee entrance to the back. Uh, in addition, new transom windows would be installed above clear glass uh, with a sort of a grill uh, applique or grill effect, which provides a nice um, up image with respect to the space. Uh, and then one of the clear glass panels would have an, a translucent film added so you couldn't be able to actually see in, so that preserved privacy. Mr. Junta? Um, I realized that the plans um, in, that you're uh, speaking of were delivered to the planning board. Um, but um, and do, do you have visuals that you wish to share so that anybody from the public uh, would be able sure. to see can, them? It's can, all right if you don't, but I want just wonder. You're certainly welcome to share them if you want to. Yes, certainly. I can. If, if the if uh, Jane, if the chair would like, I'll, I'll share my screen and show the. Uh, show the uh, plans just give me a moment here okay all right so 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 this is this is all the existing you can see the green awnings that i just mentioned here and that's the entry door on the corner and here you can see this shows you really that the, the difference between the proposed and the existing. Top here with the green awnings is the existing. This is the proposed. So you can see that here is the, the transom windows above the clear glass panels. This is to be see-through so you can see in to the waiting area. This would have the uh, treatment applied so that you can't see into the, the treatment area. This is the sort of small awning above the entry door here. And then this sign band, which you can see right now is the same color as sort of the building itself, is going to have a blue paint applied so that it creates a distinctive uh, color, color line. That's also the sign band, and it's kind of tough to see at this scale, but the main sign will be right, right here above the door. Now the back is proposed to look like this, uh, and you can see the small awning again over the rear entry door here. Uh, and then, although this isn't actually part of this proceeding, just to point out that the a directional sign would be proposed so that people parking in the Lincoln Street parking lot behind the building will know to go around to the, to the door in the corner. Um, and then here's a, a, an image that shows you basically looking through the, the glass window or glass panel that's going to be clear into the waiting area. It would look like that. And this is, this is the layout, although I'm not sure that this is particularly noteworthy other than just to show you that there is a, a total of a five chairs involved with the door in the back and the main door in the front with the waiting area here. All right. All right. Is so there any, mm -hmm. anything right, so further that, that you want to include in your presentation, Mr. Junta, or or anybody else in your team? Just to say that it's a relatively minor uh, change in terms of, uh, you know, it's, it's said not a wholesale scale rebuilding. It's taking uh, what is now a vacant storefront, occupying it with a uh, use that's for the general public uh, and will also uh, provide a fresh appearance to the building. So we'd ask the board to, to approve it as a part of the uh, application. Mm -hmm. 
All right. Um, uh, before I open um, the hearing to the public for comment, um, I just want to um, I, I just check on um, whatever comments we may have gotten from town staff on this application. Um, from um, Dennis Condon of the uh, fire uh, department, who is a chief of, chief of the fire department. Um, the fire department is okay with the change of use plan. Uh, from John Schlittler, uh, the chief of police, they need a police department has no issues. Uh, from uh, Tara Gurridge of the Department of Public Health, um, uh, the public, uh, naturally with this being a medical use, uh, the Department of Health, Public Health has certain comments um, and um, referring to, you know, the applicant must follow all uh, uh, state and local COVID-19 protocols, uh, guidance from the Department of Public Health and Board of Registration and Dentistry relating to COVID-19, face covering guidance, um, um, and these are pretty standard for the kinds of things the Board of Health has been commenting on with regard to uh, applications, um, requirements for spacing of seating, HVAC ventilation, and of course, this being a brand new space, I assume the ventilation um, is upgraded. Um, so, uh, and then pro proper storage and disposal of any bio waste hazard must be conducted on site. Um, and with a special licensed medical waste hauler uh, be engaged. Um, those are the comments from the Board of Health. And we're simply uh, referring, they attached um, uh, a, a letter from, or a memo, I guess, from uh, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts uh, Executive Office of Health and, and Human Services, uh, Board of Registration and Dentistry uh, with various guidance. Uh, so, um, those are the comments. I don't think those uh, comments raise uh, any. Madam Chair. Yes. Uh, short, shortly before this meeting started, we got an email from Alex Klee with um, an attachment from the Design Review Board. Oh. With their comments. Um, let me see. I must. I must. It just you know. It, I neglected it, that. I. It I came may... in very. Just, just very some... late this afternoon, very early this evening, like around six o'clock or so. I'm afraid I missed that. Um, Alex or Lee, do you have that? And can you summarize? Are there any changes that the Design Review Board is looking for? Sure. Um, the Design Review Board, I guess, um, reviewed, I think, the proposed changes to the um, existing awnings and the installation of the new awnings. Um, and the board, I think, thought that the proposed or proposed renovations were well designed. Um, uh, there was some discussion of the acute angle of the front entry awning um, and the applicant stated the entrance is actually recessed so has some weather protection because it's difficult um, to see that that in the, image of the images of the package. Um, the rear awning um, where there's an employee entrance, um, the signage is indicated on that awning and the board asked about the need um, for that accent to identify an entrance that is not public um, and suggested maybe that that might be rethought. I think they were okay with the transom design. Um, there was some conversation about the coping um, at the top of the wall that was to be repainted and the board asked whether the remainder of the building coping um, could also be repainted. Um, and I think that the um, property owner at the, at the DRB meeting indicated that they were willing to carry that um, painting treatment along the remainder of the front facade of the building. Um, and I think that pretty much sums up what their comments were. And if if the planning board chose um, to um, require a compliance or a change in plans uh, to to respond to the design review board comments, um, does does the uh, applicant uh, um, or the applicant's engineer uh, have any objection or uh, comment in response? The, the only thing I'd point out, Gene, is um, in general, the board, the design review board was fine with the proposal. The, their comments about the signage is sort of a separate thing because we have to go back to them for sign permits, which is a whole sort oh, of a separate proceeding. Uh, with respect to the awnings, 
uh, they did, you know, we had discussion about that, but at the end, they basically said that they were fine with it. I think if I remember, that's, that's what they indicated. And I think that's what they said in the memo as well. Lee, you can maybe verify that. Um, so I don't know that there's anything that really, other than really carrying the paint forward, but uh, the paint on the coping is sort of beyond the scope of this applicant. I mean, that's sort of the, uh, the building owner. And so I'm not sure uh, if that would be something how to incorporate that into this decision. I guess, I guess maybe you could, but mm -hmm. but so so I think really the paint the, the painting of the coping and um, and signage were really the two sort of issues that I took as being things that would need to be revisited or addressed. Could I, could I ask clarity about the awning? Um, um, I, I thought Lee that the design review board is, was looking for some change. George says oh. they're satisfied. Go ahead. I think they were they were satisfied with the signage. I, I with the awnings. I think the issue was the signage um, at the rear door um, that there could be some confusion um, with the public thinking they can access it through the rear with the signage provided on the awning. But that is really a signage issue with the design review board. And then the other, I think, real remaining issue was the issue of the painting, uh, which I understand the property owner agreed to um, carry forward. May I ask a question about that, Lee? Sure. Go ahead, Paul. Um, is is this an amendment to a special permit that applies to the entire building, so that we could include a provision about um, the painting for the rest of the building, or or is our decision really just just limited to the space that's being rented here? I believe this applies to the whole building. So I would suggest with the owner's permission that we can include a, um, a condition for that, but I would only want to do it if the owner is, is in agreement. I wouldn't, wouldn't want to impose that upon him if he doesn't feel that's something that he's willing to do. Yeah. And he is here tonight, so. Do we just speak? Uh to that, Mr. Graymon? Yes, I am here. Go ahead. Uh, yes, do you wish to speak to that with regard to the painting? Uh, I'll the, be very happy to take care of the painting. I'll be very happy to take care of the painting right. on the entire building, the coping, the painting of the coping. All right, very good, thank you. I just wanna say that I appreciate that because I think that that will add uh, greatly to the appearance of that building. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, does any other uh, planning board member have a question or comment? Um, Madam Chair? Yes. Um, I just, I had those same comments that the design review uh, board had about the awnings and, and the coping. So that's really great to hear. Um, I, in, in general, for the awnings, just, and I think it's, um, it's a very nice renovation, and I think it will really um, improve that that corner of the building definitely and um, and enhance the building one question about the awnings about that that steep what is the structure of the awning because it did seem very steep and it didn't seem like it had a lot of projection for it for covering and it was so different than the rest of the awnings on the on the sidewalk and on the building so just understanding is there is the angle um, is, is, is there an angle and if there is an angle um, is it supported similarly to the other ones or is it um, different. Yeah, this is uh, Ken File, architect with LYF Architects for the project. And yes, it would have an alum it would have a similar frame as to the green awnings. It would be a, a painted steel, a painted aluminum frame um, that is set at an angle. Um, obviously, a little bit left, a little bit right in terms of the angle. But the idea behind it was to have more of an acute angle um, right there at the uh, the front entry. Um, it provides a little additional protection from uh, the elements at the front at that front door but again the the door is already recessed mm -hmm. um and we were looking to give it a um a different look there at the corner to mm -hmm. allow this to be uh, oh, yeah. uh, branded yeah. in a separate way so just to to clarify mr fell um uh, there's some comment about protection from the weather but the uh the door is already recessed you say that is correct yeah so the, this, is, this is more of a decorative element 
it's more of a decorative than than any uh, practical purpose of shading or providing that is correct from the weather that's correct um did you have a follow-up on that uh, no i think that's that that that's great uh, one other question though i saw that the hardy board because you're changing that detail there also from the rest of the building the hardy board it seemed like it had a base, some type of a base. Is it stone base or is it concrete base or something to that effect? Yeah, we were proposing that it be a concrete curb base so okay. that the hardy board doesn't actually sit right on the sidewalk. Right. It's actually there to protect, you know, the, the actual finished materials from all the sand and salt and as much weather as we possibly can at that, at that location. That's great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I, uh, I feel I feel moved to say how wonderful it is uh, to have Natasha Espada as a newly elected member of the planning board, bringing her design experience uh, to our review of these projects. Um, uh, any other uh, planning board member uh, comments or questions? All right, then. Uh, oh, oh. oh, go ahead. Was I there? Uh, I would add that um, having reviewed the uh, the design uh, specs and so on, I think this is a great addition to the town. I think mm -hmm. this is an improvement of the building itself, which I love to see, particularly along uh, Chestnut uh, Chestnut Street. I thought uh, the design of the layout made sense, although I'm not an architect like uh, like Natasha is, our newest board member, nor the architects here presently. Um, I think this is a great addition to our town and uh, would welcome um, uh, uh, um, uh, Ms. Klein uh, to the neighborhood and wish her best of luck through the process. Thank you very much. All right, so I think we've all had an opportunity to speak. Um, um, Paul, I mean, Mark Jacobs, uh, did you have anything you want to? I had an opportunity and I don't have any questions. My only comment would be, I wanna to add to the record that I am not part of the family that was involved with the Jacobs block. Mm -hmm. Other than that, I'm perfectly happy with this application. Thank you. Uh, well, we wanna make sure if there are any persons, uh, members of the public who have who wish to comment or, or ask questions, um, on this application that they are recognized. Um, I don't know what, um, Alex Clee or Clay Hutchinson, are you looking for anybody out there who uh, is waiting uh, to be recognized? I don't see any um, hands. I concur. Okay, so we, do not, we don't see any members of the public. Um, so um, in that case, uh, if, uh, um, I'll, I'll turn to our planning director uh, to make sure we've covered uh, anything that we uh, really need to uh, in order to have enough background to prepare a decision, I guess, for uh, uh, a, a subsequent meeting. Um, so, um, Lee, if you would guide us. Um, well, I think I think um, I think I, I, I don't need anything additional to prepare um, the decision if you want to close the hearing. Um, I think we have all we received comments from all the um, reviewing boards, and um, there have been no comments from the public. Um, and I think it's a comprehensive proposal. Um, so if you wish to close the hearing, you can, and we, I can prepare a decision for you to vote at your meeting on June the first. Very good. Then, uh, do uh, we have, yes. I move. I move that we close the hearing. Okay. We have a motion to close the hearing. Is there a second? Second. second. We have motion and a second to close the hearing. Um, any discussion on that motion? Hearing none, I call for the vote. Uh, Mr. Jacobs? Aye. Mr. Alpert? Aye. Mrs. Espada? Aye. Mr. Block? Aye. And the chair is aye. So uh, the hearing is closed. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Klein and uh, uh, Mr. Genta and Mr. Fail. Uh, for your presentation. Hey, thank you very much. We'll see you on June 1st. Good luck, Doctor. Thank you very much. And Mr. Graymont, thank you for being here. You're very welcome, and oh. it was a pleasure. Yes, I forgot to thank you. Excuse me, Mr. Graymont. Thank you. Not Paul. a problem. Yeah. Um, all right. So, 
Uh, moving on to on our agenda. Um, the next appointment um, is um, the property located at 1688 um, Central Avenue. Um, and this is not a hearing. This is merely on the agenda uh, to bring the board members up to date on the status of the this application, which was a, a, originally an application for minor project site plan review. Madam Chair? Yes. Did you intentionally skip over item three on the agenda? Oh, no, uh, I'm sorry. Um, oh, of course, that's the major thing we're doing tonight. <laughs> um, um, I, I certainly did not. Uh, may I suggest that we do skip over that because the appointment was for five minutes ago and there are people in the audience, I believe, who are here for the for the 1688 Central Avenue item. And so if we can dispose of that fairly quickly, we can let those people go home. All right, uh, certainly. Um, That's my suggestion. Good, a good suggestion. And if the- um, if Adam the Chair? Block, Adam? I, I apologize. I, I, don't, I don't actually have that item on our agenda. Has there been a new agenda? It's item four. Item four. Item four I have is 105 Chestnut Street. Minor um, site plan review. The property located at 16 yes, Central. Right, right. Thank you. Very good. I have no objection to taking number four before three. I just didn't know whether you did that intentionally. No, I did not. Um, but if that is, um, if that, that would help uh, move, move the meeting along, I may as well. It, it shouldn't take much time uh, because I, I just want to um, call the board's attention. Uh, to the letter that was in our packet, um, uh, May May fourteenth, um, to the planning board from Attorney Evans Huber uh, for the applicant uh, for the daycare um, uh, center at one six eight eight Central Avenue, and he's writing on behalf of the applicant. And following discussions with uh, Ms. Newman and with uh, Town Council Christopher Heap. Um, the applicant Needham Enterprises withdraws without prejudice the pending application for minor project site plan review for the project, uh, which was scheduled for hearing tonight. Um, and it, it, it notes that Needham Enterprises is doing so based on ex some express understandings with the town. Um, and those understandings are that Needham Enterprises will be submitting by May 20th, an application for major, major project site plan review. Um, and this, of course, is something we sought, that this would be reviewed under our major project site plan review. Um, and however, um, with regard to the review, you know, responding to the review of this uh, general law chapter 40A um, section three, um, in paragraph three um, regarding um, lawful zoning provisions for daycare centers. Um, it's expressly understood and agreed that no special permit pursuant to se section 7.4 of our Needham bylaw will be required for this project, um, nor will the review criteria normally applicable to major projects I plan review be applicable in this case. Um, and the board's jurisdiction and authority will be limited to the criteria enumerated in General Laws Chapter 40A, Section 3. Um, so uh, the, the, then the matter will be scheduled for a hearing, and the hearing will be June 15, 2021. Um, um, and all the materials have already been filed, both the original application and the um, um, re more recent um, changes, proposed changes uh, with brand, a brand new set of plans. So there's no need for the applicant to refile everything. We already have everything. Um, so it seems that that's not a problem. I assume our planning director agrees that that's not a problem. So that's the letter. 
And um, I think, um, Madam Chair, this is what we're seeking. So we have it. Yes. Uh, yes. Oh, who is asking a question? It's what? it's me, Evans Huber. Oh, hello. Yes. I'm, Hi. I, I'm not sure if it's procedurally appropriate for me to comment at this point, but if it is, there's something yeah. I'd like to say. Go ahead. What, why is it appropriate for him to comment? Um, because it's not a hearing, I assume Mr. Hubert Huber is saying this is not a hearing. So, and that's true. So um, you're going to take comments from others outside the board? Okay, if that's what you want to do. Uh, no, I, well, I, all right, please, to, let's go ahead. Chair, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this matter because the minor project site plan review is being withdrawn. An application will be made for major project site plan review. And if, uh, as Mr. Jacobs points out, this is going to open this up for a lot of discussion. I don't want to go there tonight. I want, I would like that to be as, as part of the major project site plan review for which an application is going to be made. That's very, very good point. Um, because um, I've, I've read your letter you know, not word for word, but certainly I think I, I read the letter uh, carefully enough so that the board understands where where we are and where we're going. And that's the purpose of having this on the agenda tonight. Well, I, 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 I withdraw my request to be heard. OK, let me and, let me ask. And, let me ask a question. And, and, and they, there is a formality that we should do. Um, they withdraw withdrew without prejudice. And I suppose we would. Um, consent to the withdrawal without prejudice yes you need you you need you need to vote the uh, acceptance of the withdrawal without prejudice and i'll file um i'll file your vote with the town clerk mm -hmm. so we so, have not uh, yet done that yes right? yes mr jacobs we've not yet done that we've not yet taken that vote but i have a question no, we haven't so i'm looking at this letter for me and um Number one, item number one, paragraph one. The second and third sentences in that paragraph are came as a surprise to me. I don't know where that came from. I don't know how that agreement was reached. My understanding is that, and I think we were unanimous at the last meeting, we asked for town council's opinion on how to proceed. Have we received that opinion? Um, well, we have consulted with town council, um, but town council has not issued a formal written opinion. Why not? If without it, why are we doing anything procedurally? Well, why, why are we making any decision without his opinion? Because um, we're satisfied that the applicant is withdrawing. The, I mean, the issue was uh, we thought that minor uh, project site plan re review was not the appropriate um, proceeding. Who thought and, that? And, and we're thought satisfied that? that the applicant um, is essentially withdrawing that and going for major project uh, site plan approval. All I did was I thought we agreed to ask for the opinion from town council. I hadn't made my decision, any decision. I wanted town council's opinion, and I thought we all agreed that we would get town council's opinion. Where is it? Marty, if I may, because Jean and I as chair and vice chair um, have consulted with town council, and we are in agreement with town council that for various reasons under the wording of chapter 40A, section three, and various wordings under the case law, and there's numerous case law um, dealing with Chapter 40A, Section 3. Um, it would be very difficult and therefore inappropriate for town council to issue a formal opinion. Um, we, were, we were all in agreement, and I thought that the board, I thought that, that we had the board's um, some, somewhat um, uh, 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 consent to this. We certainly have considerable neighborhood um, uh, uh, request 
for this that this be brought as a major project site plan review because because under section 40a section 3 this board may issue reasonable regulations on the project but under minor project site plan review we do not have the procedure to do that we can only issue recommendations to the to the building inspector which is not an ability to issue reasonable regulations and so um uh, uh we and so town council and our planning director consulted with uh the applicant's attorney to um have him uh to have the applicant present this as a major project site plan review to give us that authority and he agreed to do that all let me let me make sure i'm being very clear i i cited number paragraph number one in Evan's letter. I understand the first sentence. I'm asking about the second and third sentence. I don't I have in front of you. Now under major project site plan review, and that's fine. And I understand that he wants to withdraw the minor project, instead go forward with major project. I, I have no problem with that. My question has to do with the second and third sentences of number one. Which How did that Which agreement come to be and um, what was the rationale? Can you can you read it to me, please? Because I don't have it no, in front of me. Says, However, it's expressly understood and agreed that no special permit pursuant to section 7.4 of the bylaw will be required for this project, nor will the review criteria normally applicable to major project site plan review be applicable in this case. Instead, the board's jurisdiction and authority will be limited to the criteria enumerated in Mass General Law 40A, Section 3. Okay, I was hoping to avoid this discussion tonight, Marty, but I will present it. I do not read those sentences as limiting us in any way more than the statute already limits us, any more than the statute and the case law under the statute already limit us. We have major project site plan review. We have chapter 40A, Section 3. The criteria for, in my opinion, the criteria under chapter 40A, section three, which includes case law there under, limits our ability to apply our major project site plan review criteria to the extent that our major, pro I read this, that to the extent that our major project site plan review criteria are consistent with chapter 40A, section three and the case law there under, we, are, we have the authority to proceed to the extent that our major project site plan review um, criteria um, are, are, are not in accord with chapter 40A section three in the case law they're under. We do not have authority under that section and that case law to, to, um, uh, uh, to issue any, any regulations. They would be considered unreasonable. We are limited to what the case law calls reasonable regulations. I don't remember if, if, if that phrase is in the statute, but, but that's certainly the phrase. I have the statute too. handy, and I could read that phrase if you. I read the could. statute seven times. Okay. I know the statute. Is is what you expressed, Paul? Is that town council's opinion as well? Mm -hmm. I haven't beginning? gone into. I haven't gone into. I I don't recall having a lengthy discussion with town council, other other than the fact that we did have um, an extensive discussion as to the criteria that the case law uh, presents. Um, uh, so under, under chapter so this is where I am. Okay, um, I haven't made my, made up my mind about anything on this case, um, but I'm a little upset because I thought we were all in agreement that we were gonna ask for town council's opinion. And that the next time, next thing I see is this letter from attorney Huber, who talks about an express understanding and agreement, which I know nothing about, I've heard nothing about, and I don't have town council's opinion. I'm mystified as to how this happened. Um, I think the agreement being referred to, there certainly is no agreement unless this board tonight agrees to it. 
So um, it's not something we're trying to keep other members of the board uh, 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 um, uh, disempowered on this. Well, I think if you look at the situation and the way it developed, I certainly feel that that's exactly what's happened. I, I agree. I agree with Marty. In fact, I would say more than this. It feels, with all due respect uh, to my colleagues, that this is a bit beyond, uh, this is an executive action beyond the scope of what we had all agreed at our prior meeting, which was simply to um, seek town council's, uh, town council's opinion or an expert opinion, an expert, uh, a specialist in zoning law. Who can, who, can, mentioned- who can specifically uh, identify, regardless of what the current status is of the application, but who can identify uh, uh, whether this is governed under uh, the Dover Amendment or through a major or minor site plan review and what the limitations of our, our authority are. That's what my understanding was. Uh, from our last meeting a couple of weeks ago. And this does seem as though well-intentioned, it is different action than what was agreed by the board. Well, one, um, in in trying to achieve um, the action in this letter, that is, um, the, withdrawal of the, um, without prejudice of the pending application for minor project, in order to achieve that goal, um, the applicant is anxious to have this move forward quickly uh, to a hearing um, and, and on June 15th. Um, so we tried to move expeditiously to get to that point and to lay out this scenario that's that's co- that's covered under our article two of that letter article one creates creates an agreement and an understanding the basis of which the understanding i, I would suggest is false and is not the understanding of the board as a whole nor was an agreement ever contemplated or discussed at our prior need it. Well, um, do, am I hearing uh, from um, you, Marty Jacobs, and you, Adam Block, that you're unwilling um, to accept the withdrawal without prejudice on, uh, on this understanding? You haven't heard that from me. I'm happy to accept that. What I'm not happy to accept is any understanding or agreement that I knew nothing about, have, have no knowledge of. I don't know what the basis of it is. I haven't seen town council's opinion. I have the second and third sentences of Evan's letter that, that number numbered one, the second and third sentences, I, I'm not, I can't sit here and say, I agree to that. How, how well, I? I will point out that the, uh, numerous cases uh, relevant to this subject, um, appell- appellate cases. Um, I understand. I've were read included it. in our packet uh, for any of us to read to see um, the way this issue has been treated by the courts. Um, I've read the cases. We don't have a summary from town council of of the law based on those cases, but we do have the cases in front of us. I've read the cases. Mm-hmm. Okay, good. Yep. So you you know you know from your reading of the cases um, what the difficulties are uh, with going ahead um, if, with a special permit process or in any way suggesting that uh, we could deny this project under any kind of special permit proceeding. I've read the cases. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, I I really then don't know uh, what our next step is um, if if we're not prepared uh, to. Madam Chair, uh, I move that we accept the withdrawal of the minor project site plan review 
application without prejudice. That's my motion. Um, is there a second for that motion? Uh, I'll accept it. I'll second it, but I, I want to be crystal clear that no vote that I'm prepared to take tonight in any way is going to sanction the second and third sentences of number one in Evan's May 14th letter. I concur. And I want to express my opinion that we are limited in what we can do by chapter 40A, section three and the case law there under. And I, in my opinion, the letter does not add anything to that. So, in, so I, I take it you're, in, you're agreeing with me that you're not sanctioning the second and third sentences. I don't see that they're the, meaningless. I don't that. see that the second and third sentences add anything that limit us in any way other than as chapter 40A, section three, and the case law there under already limits us. Do you agree with that, Jean? Yes, I do agree with that. Okay, um, good. I'm glad that you both have been- So we have the motion to accept the withdrawal without prejudice um, as outlined in the first paragraph of this letter. Um, is that, that's the understanding, right? Uh, can, I ask a, can I ask a question? What's, and, what's the impact uh, of withdrawing without prejudice? Just for- uh, That means- that. That means that the applicant could file a new application for a minor project site plan approval. Um, but I, I assume that's what without prejudice means. So I, you know, even though the withdrawing this, this is common um, discussion on the motion, which has been seconded. I, I mean, I'm hoping that Attorney Huber and and Roy are hearing that the second and third sentences of number one in your letter have been recognized by all four members who have spoken tonight about this as being essentially adding nothing and really meaningless. I just, because that's what they've said. Um, yes, Natasha. Sure. I just wanted to state that I am a neighbor of this project. I'm at 1681 Central Avenue and I need to recuse myself from this project. So that's oh, yeah. why I have not given any opinion on this. I, I'm very glad you mentioned that, N Natasha, that uh, of course um, it's true. Yes. So and we would not a expect a, a, uh, a vote uh, coming from Nat our member, Natasha Espada. But we take this vote, I just want to make sure that, that Roy and Evans have both heard and recognize what, what I said actually at the very beginning of tonight, even maybe even before 715, which is that uh, there's a good chance and I'm not going to be available on June 15th. And I would that's when this is going to be scheduled for, and Natasha's recusing herself. You're down to three members. I don't I don't know what that means as far as what you want to do on June 15th, but I just want to make sure you're aware of it. Since you raise that, Marty, yeah, I would like to um, ask our planning director to consult with town council because um, you are not going to be there. Natasha has to recuse herself. It is possible that Jean will not make the meeting. I will make the meeting if I have to. Well, you, but just in case. Yeah. Well, if I had I'm some asking. kind of technical difficulties, right. certainly. Yeah. Right. And so I would like to ask whether Natasha being present, even though she's recusing herself, can mm -hmm. uh, go towards constituting a quorum. Because if Natasha has to, because if Natasha being present does not go to our having a quorum and Marty's not there and for some reason Jean can't be there, we won't have a quorum. Well, um, the quorum of the meeting is, is, is determined at the very beginning of the meeting. Um, but it's true, I suppose, uh, that- I believe- I If believe we were in, the, if we were in the meeting room, Natasha would remove herself from the table and go and sit on the other side of the right. room. I, yeah. believe, I believe that Natasha will be able to be counted for the quorum, but I would like to make sure. 
I just would like to say something that I have a call into the state ethics committee um, and I will I can ask them that as well. Thank well, you. I think, the, I think the other issue then is we the hearing would have to probably be continued or then Marty would need to listen to the tape of the meeting in order to be able to vote um, and participate that way. Okay, that's true. Yeah, so that's and I would say be able to accomplish this. Um, assuming I don't have technical difficulties, um, and then the backup is if I did. Assuming that Natasha Espada would still be accounted in the quorum, um, we could go forward with the hearing and then continue it as you suggest. Right? Marty just made a comment or asked a question, and I didn't hear what it was. I just oh, sorry. To it. The next meeting after the 15th is June 29th, I think, according to what Alex was saying at the very beginning. Yes, that's correct. Okay, so I should be able to make the June 29th meeting and I should be able to listen to the tape. Should. Okay. So we have a motion and we have a second. Um, so if there's no further discussion, um, I call for a vote. Mr. Jacobs. Aye. Mr. Alpert. Aye. Mr. Block. Aye. And the chair is aye. And with Natasha Espada uh, recusing herself, um, that is um, four votes um, with one recusal in favor of the motion um, to accept the withdrawal without prejudice of this application. So I think that's that takes care of that agenda item uh, for this evening and we'll move forward. All right, thank you. So uh, I didn't realize that would take uh, as much time as it did, um, but we uh, now move to the um, major project site plan uh, special permit. And this, um, no, excuse me. <laughs> this is the decision, of course. Um, this is the decision of item number four on major project site plan special permit number 2021 um, with regard to um, the property at um, 100, 110 West Street, Needham, Mass. And this is to be regarding the development of the property to include an 83 unit assisted living and Alzheimer's memory care facility and 72 independent living apartments. Um, and we uh, did have um, a hearing um, uh, on this, and uh, we have a decision um, that has been prepared by our planning director. And uh, I know I have a copy of it here. Um, um, I do want to, oh, I should mention that we did get. Um, we haven't made, of course, we haven't made a decision tonight. So tonight would be our opportunity to make that decision. Um, and um, Ms. Ch Madam Chairman, can I just interject for something? I'm just noticing yeah. on the participants list is a Holly Clark who has her hand raised. I don't know if you want to recognize her, but I just want you to be aware of it. Oh, uh, thank you. Uh, yes, um, we, uh, I believe. If Ms. Clark is um, here to, um, to discuss the West Street project, of course we'll recognize her. Um, that's, um, but, no, excuse me. I even misspoke on that. The only item on our agenda tonight that involved a public hearing was uh, Dr. Klein's project at 32 Chestnut Street. And other than that, um, we uh, we are not having a public hearing and um, we're not recognizing members of the public to speak. And we're all set with that agenda item. So, um, and as you may recall, and I assume Holly Clark, because we've had a lot of communication with Holly Clark, is here because of her interest in the um, 1688 Chestnut Street project. And uh, 
we did not allow the applicants to speak and we're we've moved on from that agenda item at this point Ma madam chair yes i would though in, in fairness to her um or anyone else who may be a participant to certainly follow up for this meeting with any subsequent correspondence to the board um you know she has her, her hand up now so any comment or question that she has at this time she can certainly raise uh a subsequent to this meeting um and can well, certainly yes certainly and uh all of the correspondence that's come in from um members of the public i know i have read every single word every single email um and uh, i know at the public hearing uh, we'll give everyone an opportunity, a full opportunity to speak. Um, so, uh, so on West where Street, we are now is yes. Street, um, can I have a recollection? Did we did we close the hearing or did we just continue? West Street, we closed it. We closed the hearing. Okay. Mm -hmm. But we right. still need to vote the relief. Do we do that before we discuss the decision or after? Um, I think it's a good idea to do it um, to discuss the decision because then when we when we discuss the relief, I mean, we grant the relief, we know what the decision is that we're going to move on as the next motion. Thank you. But um, I do want to uh, make sure. Uh, we introduce uh, persons who are here because there may be things we want to discuss with them uh, regarding the decision. And we do have with us um, Roy Kramer, um, counsel for the applicant LCB Senior Living. Uh, we also have Evans Huber, uh, um, also counsel for LCB uh, Senior Living. Um, we have uh, Lee Bloom. Uh, oh, do we? Yeah. Oh, yes, Mr. Yeah. Bloom is here, um, principal, I believe, of LCB uh, Senior Living. Um, also, uh, Louise Giacanis, um, identified as a counsel for seller. Uh, Ms. Giacanis, that means the seller of the property, the current owner. Council to the owner, uh, Well Tower Inc. Council to the owner, Well yeah. Tower. Yeah. And um, Anthony Vivirito uh, is here with us, who is the project architect. Um, so um, we have uh, we have a decision. Uh, also, we have I should mention um, further correspondence from the design. No, that's that's not not relevant. That was for another project. Um, so we have the decision. Uh, we have some uh, comments on the proposed decision. Um, let's see. I, uh... While you're looking for that, I'll just state that um, I had some. Uh, changes that were of the knit variety or um, correcting some typos, and I've already given those uh, to our staff. Mm -hmm. um, I know I had, oh yes, here it is, yes. Um, very good. Um, the decision that we have before us, um, did that reflect your, um, your changes, which I understand, Paul, were non-substantive? So yeah. there are some you know, typing errors and that sort of thing you pointed right. out that are in this decision? There were some spacing errors, some lack of, lacks of, 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 of closing a quote, um, an inaccurate reference to 2011 when it should have been 2021, um, changes of that nature. Nothing, nothing we need to discuss, but thank you for pointing that out, uh, Paul Alpert. So yes, I, I do have the, the memo uh, of response um, from, um, Um, Evans Huber, uh, with regard to the decision, uh, uh, raising having some questions and uh, issues with with uh, some conditions and wording. Um, so, uh, 
do board members have any uh, issues or concerns that they wish to raise with regard to the decision? Well, other than discussing the issues raised in Mr. Huber's email? Right, so we'll, make, we'll focus that on them if there are no other issues that any board member wishes. I have no other other than uh, attorney. Okay, um, so uh, the, um, the email, uh, Mr. Uh, Attorney Huber's email raises um, seven uh, concerns on, on their part. Um, I'm sure. So go through them and, and we can discuss, I think it makes sense to discuss them one by one. Madam um, Chair, Madam yes. Chair, yes. Um, uh, could I have a few minutes to just speak about um, some of these, some of my comments in the email? Certainly, go ahead. Okay. So what I've done is I've tried to group them into sort of the the less important ones and the more important ones for the purposes of this presentation. One that I want to just take off the table right now is in my uh, paragraph two relating to section three point five. Um, that had to do with whether or not the petitioner was going to pay for the cost of the monitoring agent. We're withdrawing the request that that be changed. In other words, we are accepting the decision as written in that regard. Thank you. Okay. Uh, there are three others that are of sort of of the minor variety. Uh, 3.14 has to do with whether or not, among other things, has to do with whether or not uh, the generator has to be screened, uh, the emergency generator uh, that's over by the railroad tracks, whether or not that has to be screened. Um, we, uh, the, the current generator is not screened and we understand that uh, presumably the main reason for screening has to do with noise attenuation. Uh, we certainly elsewhere in the decision, we're gonna be required to demonstrate compliance with uh, noise regulations with respect to that generator. So we were um, the only part of 3.14 that we were requesting be changed was the requirement that the generator be screened. Um, with respect to, but we don't need to spend a lot of time on that. With respect to 3.30, again, a minor thing, the decision as written indicates that the dumpster enclosure would be made of wood. The, the plans that we submitted that were approved by the DRB uh, indicated that the dumpster enclosure would be surrounded by a vinyl fence. Uh, we are just requesting that that be changed to allow us to have a vinyl fence, which lasts longer and in our view looks better um, rather than the wood that's currently specified in section 3.3. And then um, in 3.3, again, a minor issue. Uh, in 3.37C and 3.38E, there is a requirement that the um, certain certifications relating to the as-built and the noise attenuation um, compliance for the generator be approved by the board. Those are documents that we're gonna have to prepare and, and, and uh, submit to the board. And we were simply asking that the uh, decision clarify that while those things will require board approval, they don't require a public hearing. So those were what we consider to be fairly minor uh, requested changes to the decision. There are uh, a few others that are, excuse me, uh, two others that are more significant to us and then one that is extremely significant to us. The two that are more significant um, have to do with um, 3.31, which is the lighting. And we, I had spent some time going back and forth with Ms. Newman about the language of the paragraph relating to lighting, exterior lighting, you know, in the parking areas. And basically the issue that we were trying to grapple with is that while we certainly understand and respect the need to reduce the lighting in the parking lot at night, uh, to reduce the impact on neighbors, neighboring properties, um, we want to make sure that it's the decision also sort of recognizes that there's a countervailing consideration, which is safety. Um, there are, you know, this project will have assisted living, um, but it will also have independent living uh, residents who will not necessarily be home by 1030 or 11 or 1130 when our, our shift changes. So we were simply asking that the 
this section be written in such a way as to recognize that there needs to be some flexibility balancing those two considerations. Um, and we had proposed some language in my email to try to accomplish that. And then uh, section 1.12 and 3.32, it's the same, those two sections relate to the same issue, which is uh, compliance with LEED, L-E-E-D, um, silver criteria. Um, the applicant, um, typically the most recent two or three builds that the applicant has done are uh, compliant with a different but very similar standard called the National Green Building uh, Standard. Um, but we understand that that set of standards may not be as familiar to the board as LEED. Everybody has heard of LEED. Um, National Green Building may not have quite the uh, airtime that LEED does. And so, and they are very similar. So we, um, you know, we would prefer, we had proposed some language that says that we will comply with LEED Silver or National Green Building Standards. Um, but uh, if the board's not comfortable with that, we can stick with the LEED Silver with, with two sort of qualifiers that I had added to the language. One is we just wanted to make sure that the documentation demonstrating compliance or, or demonstrating to compliance to the extent reasonably possible would be prepared by uh, the project architect who is LEED certified. So we just added some, uh, you know, a few words indicating that that would be prepared by the project architect. And the other is just uh, to sort of flesh out a little bit the concept of good cause for not completely meeting LEED silver criteria. If that happens, it'll be because it's an existing building and in some instances, it's not really practical to make an existing building, especially one of this age, um, lead, lead silver compliant. So we had proposed uh, a rewrite of 3.32 that addresses uh, those two issues. And that was, the, that was the, the rationale behind why we were proposing that. And then the last one, uh, well, which- well, Can I just interrupt for one second? Also, we need a similar rewrite to section 1.12, so that 1.12 and 3.32 are consistent. Yes. Yes, thank you, Roy. I, I neglected to add that 1.12 and 3.32 deal with the same topic. So if the board was amenable to changing 3.32 in the way that I've suggested, it would be appropriate to change 1.12 in a similar way. Okay. And then the you last- You didn't have that reference in your heading, but-, um, but Right, I, I right. I, 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 didn't, I didn't submit a proposed no rewrite. No. I didn't submit a proposed rewrite of 1.12, but it would be the same issue. Consistent. Mm -hmm. So they were consistent. Yeah. And then the last, and, and in our view, um, by far the most important is um, 3.17. And that is a provision which, which requires board approval if the operation of the, uh, of the, pro of the facility changes. Um, and uh, this, is, um, this is far and away the, 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 ish, the topic of greatest concern uh, to my client because for several reasons. Um, first of all, if LCB were for some reason to no longer be the entity operating and there was some other similar entity that comes in, any such entity will have to be fully vetted by uh, the Executive Office of Elder Affairs. It's a very comprehensive uh, regulatory framework that would govern anybody that was coming in to replace LCB. So to the extent the board's concern was that uh, we wanna make sure that somebody comes in who knows what they're doing and is highly qualified. That's, that is more than adequately addressed by the regulatory framework under which any such entity would be licensed by EOEA. Uh, but also um, this kind of a provision will be, has, has significant negative uh, financial ramifications uh, 
Ms. Giannakis, who's here on behalf of the owner, uh, can speak to this probably better than I can, but um, this kind of a this kind of language is would be very problematic for lenders um, as well as the owner of the property. So we feel like it has a lot of potential negative um, impact and it doesn't advance the town's interest because the town's interest, which is presumably to make sure that any new entity that took over for LCB was you know, highly qualified and, and, and would run the place well, that that interest is fully protected by EOEA's regulatory requirements and framework. So that is a 3.17 is a provision that we are asking be taken out. We certainly have no problem notifying the town or the board it, it, in the event that any such change were taking place. Uh, but the provision that requires us to get the consent of the board to do that, um, we are, are requesting be taken out. But then um, what I propose we do um, is go down the items, more or less in the order you presented them, um, Attorney Huber, um, and take care of the easy ones first, and then get to the, the one that you described as most important, that is uh, item four, um, at the end of our discussion, uh, because I think we may be able to tick off the others very quickly. And when we get to that item, um, if, if, it, if, if the board feels it, it would be helpful, we could have uh, uh, Ms. Giannakis speak, speak to that as well. Um, so um, item two is an easy one uh, because that is the cost of the monitoring agent. Uh, you're satisfied that um, that will be paid. Um, so. Uh, the way Lee had worded it originally, there's not going to be any change in that. Uh, so then item three on the generator. Um, uh, I believe that um, it's our practice uh, for buildings that have external generators, um, not only to um, have screening to attenuate the no noise, um, but just to have screening for this kind of industrial looking apparatus um, for the sake of, of the view of the property from abutting properties. Um, and um, I know that it's at the back of the property along the railroad right of way, um, but there are properties on the other side of the railroad right of way. Um, they are a commercial and industrial type properties now. We don't know where what might go there in the future. Um, so um, uh, do we want to just stop and discuss that uh, subject? And um, Lee, if I express the fact that correctly, that this is what, something we generally ask for? We generally ask for landscape screening around generator installations. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And actually, uh, I believe you said uh, when you and I discussed this that um, the um, you, without going back and looking at the prior decision, you thought perhaps that had that had been a just a, a requirement uh, for the prior I, generator, and maybe the landscaping simply died out. I don't. I don't know specifically what happened at the prior generator installation here. I mean, the permit's almost you know twenty five years old. I know in the case of Wingate where we required that they provide some kind of landscaping around their generator installation. And you, uh, okay. Uh, so um, board members, um, the generator is um, approximately, what is the size of the generator in like height and width? Does anybody have that on the tip of their tongue? Or the project architect, perhaps Mr. Favorito? I think it's it's this Lee Bloom with LCB Senior Living. Um, yes. The width is about four feet. The length is about 12 feet. I'm not positive of the height. Um, we do have, we would will have the fence on the west side between us and the railroad tracks. There's going to be a fence. So that side is screened. I see. Okay. North and south is screened by landscape. So the only thing we're really talking about is the parking lot side. Um, I, I, off the top of my head, I'm not sure how much space we have between the generator and the parking lot to plant there, 
or with the axis. The, the, there's a sound attenuating enclosure that goes around this. It's part of the equipment of what we're buying. And that's what we had evaluated by our acoustical consultant. The decision will provide all that information for the board with a letter how we're meeting the code. Um, so we did buy the enclosure that went with it. So the actual generator itself will be enclosed by that. But to someone that doesn't understand generators, it's gonna look like the generator. It's just gonna be a metal enclosure. It's not what I would consider screening you're talking about. And, you know, uh, so we're only talking about the east side facing our building. Uh, and if the board's passionate about us screening it, we'll screen it. I, you know, I don't we, we, think it's necessary since it's never been screened uh, specifically on that side, but nothing we need to spend a ton of time on. If the board okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bloom. It was helpful to realize that there is going to be a fence all along the railroad right of way. So this generator actually will not be visible from properties on the opposite side of the railroad right of way. That's it will correct. be visible from the parking lot of the premises itself. Um, but it, it also, it, but it will be surrounded by a noise attenuating screen. That is um, correct. And board members, um, Mr. Albert has his hand raised. Yeah, but it will be, it will be visible to the residents and their visitors. That is and correct. And wouldn't you want it to look nice? your residents and the and their visitors maybe i've seen so many of them it doesn't look foreign or bad to me <laughs> especially where it's located you go in now when it's very visible because the lot of the fence is down and all that i don't even notice it but again that's just me i i that's why i'm not this isn't a passion plea if, yeah. if it feels more comfortable if we do some other screening with some landscape we'll do it i th i i think it would look nicer if it were screened and, and then then let's move on okay <laughs> Well, it sounds like we have uh, um, an agreement that uh, go ahead, go ahead with uh, some landscape screening, uh, yeah. so that it even so that uh, apparatus will be screened even from sure. the parking parking lot side. Um, so the the wording, um, Lee, in the proposed decision on that, does that reflect what was just agreed to in a satisfactory way? Yes, we're not, we're not going to change. Um, yes, we're, they asked us to change the wording. We're not. Gonna, we won't be changing the wording. Okay. But so it'll be landscape. Uh, yes. Screen. Yep. Okay. So the next uh, item uh, was item five: the fencing of wood and vinyl. Um, uh, board members, does anybody have any comment about that, or do you just want to go along with the the, the wood I've, and vinyl? I've, I've got no problem with that. Good point. Yeah. Um, so Natasha, I'm, I'm fine with vinyl, Adam, right? Sorry. So no comment, no concern. We'll change it to, to, to as requested to. Uh, Madam Chair, I have a quick question. Is the yes. and I'm not as familiar. Is is the wood um, natural wood that would, or, or is it painted wood, or it just says wood? It just says wood. Okay. We never proposed wood. We only proposed vinyl, and that's what went to the design review board. So. But again, color stuff like that. If there's Natasha, a wood is our usual language. That's all. Yeah. yeah. No, I was just, I was just wondering because the vinyl will will have a color. If it was, a, if it had said natural wood, it would, it would become gray eventually and kind of disappear. So I guess the question is, it, has it gone to design review and what color is the vinyl? Anthony, do you remember if we gave DRB a, a color? I don't remember. I don't remember either, Lee. They, you know, I it, did, vinyl, it did go to Ms. Espada, it did go to DRB though. Okay. The only reason I ask is because if you put a white vinyl fence there, you have the trains going by, it's going to get all messy with, with all of the um, trains well, just, and everything Ms. and the wood, you know. Ms. Espada, right now what we're talking about is the enclosure around the dumpsters. Those are not next to the railroad. This is much on the opposite side of the parking area adjacent so it, to the building. Okay, so it's not the fence that's against the... That's right. No, no right. That, that, well, I don't know what that fence is gonna be. It may be a sound attenuating fence to just help with the train. We have it, we're looking at that right now. But the location of the dumpster is actually a very visible area of the property. We have amenity areas to the left and right of it. So we're very concerned about the aesthetic of it for sure. Um, and again, that's one of the reasons I get vinyl because it lasts, color's cr critical, I couldn't agree more. But again, this isn't a hill we're gonna die on either if the board's passionate about wood, it's okay. 
if it's vinyl. Um, I, I'd like to remind the board that uh, last year uh, we had a case in Needham Center that there was a wooden enclosure around a dumpster and uh, it was replaced by vinyl. Uh, it had been, it had rotted away three times over the years and uh, they finally put vinyl um, and the board thought that was fine. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm not against, people. I'm not against vinyl. I just wanted to know if it was going against the railroad tracks because depending upon um, where the location is and it, I thought it was in the edge of the railroad tracks, um, oh, yeah. just the color of the vinyl, the wood, the wood weathers in a different way. So just. Yep. Okay, but it, it is it is around the rub, the rubbish enclosure. Uh, so okay. um, we're okay with uh, adding the wood and vinyl. Sounds like okay. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And then uh, item seven. Um, let's see. Um, uh, oh, on the on the request that the approval does not require a public hearing. Um, we we always we are very often put in items that require approval of the planning board, um, and we never we never say one way or another that it requires a public hearing. It's a it's our practice to have the applicant come in and show us what needs to be approved, and and we we look at it and decide about it. Um, but um, you know, to, to, to start saying it doesn't require a public hearing, um, I, I'm just not sure about the issues that that might raise. Um, uh, well, we, we know we, that the usual practice is, is not to do it, not to open a public hearing, is just to give you the plans, you review them and you approve them. So that's been uh, kind of what, what's been done, but uh, the reason to clarify uh, in the event there was a, a, a disagreement. Yeah, Jean, Mr. Alpert has a question. Thank you, Mr. No, Kirk. I have a comment. This is not going to changes to the plan. This is this is just the approval of the as-built plans and the noise analysis. Oh, right. yes. Oh, thank you for correcting me. And, um, so, and so I've got no problem in cl including the language where we don't require a public hearing for that anyway. Agreed. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we'll just go along with that. Thank you. Um, so that takes care of all the items that were considered minor items. Uh, now going to the more significant items. Um, item six, um, there is new language proposed uh, regarding the lighting and the new language still addresses the concern of preventing annoyance to neighbors. Um, but I gather that the applicant uh, uh, was not satisfied with the wording as proposed because there was a concern. My, that... my concern is strictly safety. Uh, so so ju just to clarify, uh, Madam Chair, in my email, uh, item six, there's language here that I am proposing be used to substitute for 3.31 as currently written. I had discussed mm -hmm. this with Ms. Newman I told her that we wanted to have some language in here reflecting the balance between reducing annoyance to neighbors and maintaining a safe level of lighting. Um, and also the fact that the shift change is at 11, so people may not be coming out exactly at 11. So when we, the lighting reduction should be at 1130 rather than 11. So what I've, what I've written in here is what we are asking the board to adopt. And have board members had an opportunity to um, to see that paragraph, or do you want it read? Or uh, does anybody have an objection to making this change um, to the description of attenuation of lighting? No, I've read it. I have no problem with the language as proposed. Yeah, I have, no I have none either. Um, Natasha, uh, are you okay with it? You're okay with it. All right, then um, it sounds like we're all right with that. Um, Thank you. Uh, item number six. And then item, then now we go back to item number one um, on the um, green building standards, uh, whether it would be expressly limited to leads or the national green building standard. Yeah, I appreciate I that having been provided to us. I can't say I had the time to read it really, except for the summary. Um, 
but do you want to speak to it? Uh, Mr. Just, just very quickly, you know, as Evans had indicated, our last few builds, builds we've switched over to the to, uh, green building standard, understanding that it's it, a lot of people don't understand it. It's lead became the brand like Kleenex, uh, but they are very similar and it's not appropriate for me to expect that I could send you something, a lot of information today, and you can read it and, and comprehend it and deal with it tonight. I'm good with lead. That's absolutely fine. Um, it's more about making sure it's okay that a project architect submit the checklist and that it's understood that there may be elements of the building that exist. For example, the envelope. We're not changing the envelope. So we may lose some points because of the construction of the envelope that if, if we're two points away from silver and it's because of that envelope that that's taken into consideration. That's the only point here. Mm -hmm. So it's the, 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 the changing word would allow compliance with either the um, LED criteria or the National Green Building criteria. Um, and the checklist would be prepared by the project applicant rather than an outside consultant. Um, and um, and it will show that it, uh, the that the applicant has met these standards, except for good cause. And then it gives an example of good cause, including but not limited to the limitations imposed by the existing building. And it's not going to be the applicant; it will be the project architect. And and Anthony can speak to it if you'd like. But it's very typical that TAT, the architectural firm, writes letters of compliance to a municipality for lead. Uh, the majority, you know, many of their architects are lead certified there, so they're competent and capable. You don't want me doing it. <laughs> no, I understand. That. So, so it would be the project architect. And again, if the board's not comfortable because they don't, they're not familiar with National Green Building, then eliminate it, and and it's only lead. That that's fine. Um, and Lee, at what stage? Um, I have to go back and find it in the decision, but perhaps you can tell me. At what stage in the project uh, do we get this uh, approval or checklist um, prepared, submitted to us? Let me just go back. I think it's prior to CO. That's what I was wondering. Yeah, I think. It would have to be the CO because yeah. things yeah, would be built. Otherwise, it would have to be the CO, but I think that should be added as, as, as an explicit statement. And it's not there now. I'm just looking That's at fine. that. Uh-huh. Uh, that should be added as a, as a specific condition. Mm -hmm. I mean, the uh, emergency generator condition is in there. The affordable housing provision is in there. Um, it should be added, I think, also into section three three eight. The reference to it. Well, for Good. Uh, see, uh, my my only question about that is that um, under the the building codes, uh, this this is not required. That this is something extra on top of it. So right now, the you know to get a building permit and follow the building codes, um, you don't need to have lead silver or whatever. Uh, I would hate to have a certificate of occupancy held up because someone is having a dispute about one particular Standard. checklist item. But without it being tied to the certificate of occupancy, what uh, what effect does it have? How do we enforce it? Um, but and, and and I'll put that question out. But I also want to recognize Natasha Spado, who has a comment question. Oh, yeah, so I, I'm lead certified, um, and so one question I've done a lot of lead buildings, and I'm doing all net zero buildings right now. So and we do renovations, and we do net zero renovations too. So one question um, that I have for you is: I'm totally okay with the project architect submitting it. There's no reason why they can't submit it. Um, I, I believe. Um, and I guess the question is, I know that the National Green Building Standard is less stringent than LEED, right? And I understand what you're saying, that you're not touching the envelope. So um, the type of work that you're doing for the project is the assessed value of the building. It's not, the percentage of it is not big enough to create envelope changes um, by the building code. Anthony, can you address that, please? You're muted, yeah. I'm unmuted, yeah. <laughs> Uh, the assessed value. So right now we're going through the uh, code compliance portion of the design <clears throat> and the building will uh, fall under a level three renovation under the existing building code. 
Okay. Uh, the type of compliance, uh, and it's essentially a uh, almost a complete gut renovation. So those portions of the building which we're affecting or modifying or changing will be brought up to current standards, current energy okay. code standards. But I, I would echo that the, the request that the building be lead silver uh, scored is for, in our, in our experience, in our firm for existing buildings is above and beyond what the building code requires us to do. So we, we, there's, a, there's an aspect here of uh, this type of renovation where we simply be limited in um, some of these items. And the building envelope is one such item uh, that, that Lee uh, Bloom identified. But level three renovation requires, uh, I thought, IEBC. Um, yeah, the, the 2018 IEBC is uh, now in effect. And right. uh, we are in the beginning uh, stages of uh, understanding the implications of the new energy code uh, and Needham is also a stretch code community as well. Correct. Um, That's so what I'm saying. I, I mean, I, I find it hard to believe that you, if you're gutting the whole building and you're, I, I assume you're adding new systems, that you wouldn't be able to meet the minimum requirements to get lead silver. Yeah, well, it's a, it's a, candidly, it's a process that we have to go through that we've just started. The project is um, working its way out of schematic and design development into, um, into the CDs. And I think by and large, that that's accurate. That the the new the new systems that we're putting in the building, um, the HVAC systems, the plumbing systems, um, the insulation that we're going to re-roof the entire building, all of that would it would um, would get us to uh, close to a silver. But I, I cannot at this point I cannot say that that's a guarantee. Yeah, we haven't we haven't scored the building yet. Um, and again, we, we, when Anthony and I had all our conversations, we felt it's very reasonable that we can achieve it, just we're not sure yet. That's all. Um, Mr. Uh, Viverito, uh, if the um, um, other alternate standard, the National Green Building criteria were used, um, do you feel uh, more comfortable that that uh, would certainly be achieved? Uh, to be uh, honest with you, I don't, um, I've never uh, personally scored uh, using that standard, and that's usually handled by a consultant. So it's difficult for me to, to tell you at this moment in time uh, whether we would achieve uh, a silver, their equivalent uh, silver. Um, Lee had, had, had pointed out that uh, some of our other projects with LCB that were ground up construction uh, met uh, scored uh, bronze or silver uh, using that standard, but uh, here an existing building is a different animal altogether. And um, it's, I think it's important to, um, to make that point. And we're, I want to repeat, we're okay with the LEED standard, um, but we're, that's, we're just asking for some language so it's understood what we're dealing with and considered, which may be, it may be moot, hopefully it is. I just don't know for sure. All right, um, let me ask um, board members, um, do we care? Um, uh, uh, I mean, we, we put in leads, um, the applicant is willing, uh, had proposed an alternative standard, but now says that it really doesn't matter. Um, should we go with the leads? Um, and is the language that's proposed here otherwise acceptable? Um, um, Adam Block. What, generally, I, I don't think I have a problem with a different standard. I think the challenge with standards, um, you know, I've dealt with this issue before when I was in, a, uh, in the media business, and some of you may remember the VHS versus the Betamax as a different <laughs> standard. Uh, and the, some of the challenges with these standards is that they can be a scenario where it's basically a bot system uh, and um, to what extent is it actually regarded as a truly independent system? Uh, some may be more residential based, some may be more commercial based, plus include other sectors. Um, Natasha can, I'm sure, can speak better to this. I will say that um, that 
uh, that Paul had mentioned when we were dealing with uh, you know the muzzy rezoning that we were going to look at uh, uh, energy efficiency standards for all builds for the town as a matter of public policy. So uh, here we're making a decision. I would probably keep it consistent with our existing bylaw with a requirement to meet the needs of the stretch code. And, uh, and subsequently, I think, and Natasha, I'm sure you're gonna be instrumental in our uh, you know, discussion about the goal of um, producing more energy efficient uh, builds in town, but I would say probably for now to that we're kind of bound by the existing uh, building code, um, which includes the uh, the stretch code. So, Adam, you're saying that you would delete this uh, condition entirely because, of course, compliance with the stretch code is is required. Yes. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, well, um, I mean, um, does anybody uh, else, um, Mr. Jacobs, Mr. Alpert, um, want to comment on this um, just to wrap it up and see what we're all in a, a basic agreement on? I do have a question. On the proposed language, there's a parenthetical in the last sentence. Except for good cause, including but not limited to the limitations imposed by the existing building. So my question is, what other good cause are we contemplating here other than uh, limitations imposed by the existing because good cause apparently goes somewhat beyond that in in what what are we talking about Is that well the good clearly? marty the language the language that lee put in there has the parenthetical except for good cause they're just adding the including but not limited to language uh -huh. what that's worth <clears throat> okay but i mean so what did lee contemplate when she put in good cause what what does good cause mean here it means if, if they haven't met it we they show us why <laughs> mm -hmm. there's some explanation yeah yeah and you and you can't you know it's something you may have no idea about the particular issue until you're doing some demo and find something so it's really, it's, it's good language to put in because you really don't know all the answers at this point. So um, oh, okay. it sounds like we have choices. We either go with the original language, but we, I, I suppose the phrase including but not limited to the limitations imposed by the existing building is requested to be added. Um, and and also, the, also the phrasing about prepared by the project architect. Right? Oh yes, uh, prepared by the project architect, okay. Um, so those would there, be- I'm gonna changes. say that I've got no problem with their wording changes, uh, but I I hate to do this to you, Natasha, because this is your first yeah. meeting, but I'm going to defer to Natasha as to the issue about including national green building criteria as to whether, because um, I know nothing about this and, um, uh, if we should, and the applicant is willing to just keep it at lead instead of the national green building, but but if Natasha is okay with national green building, then I'm okay with it. And the other the the other wording changes, I'm I'm fine with. You said it's less stringent. Is that correct, Natasha? It is less stringent, um, and it's not typical for. It might be typical for homes or multifamily more than other projects, um, but. I'm not as familiar with it. I'm more familiar with LEED well and many others um, that have been used. I think, I think in general, I'm, I'm completely okay with the project architect submitting it as long as they have to be LEED certified because that's one of the requirements of it. Um, I, I feel like we should keep the LEED silver just because it is a standard and we had last night. I, I know that the planning board was invited as well as all the other boards in town to a um, to the PPBC meeting where they were discussing uh, net zero buildings and they were also discussing just in general um, the creating a standard for, for the town or thinking about creating a standard for the town regarding environmental and sustainability issues, which were also, I remember brought up on other, when there were other zoning changes, um, you know, submitted to town recently. So 
I would recommend keeping lead silver. If there is something that is uh, a hardship because of your particular uh, renovation, and there's a reason why you, you can't meet one criteria or something like that, I think it's something to be reviewed. But um, in general, I don't see why lead silver for a renovation could not be um, with while you're doing the stretch code and knowing the IEBC, why, why it couldn't be met. You're in a situation where you have next to transportation. There are a lot of other points in innovation that could be um, assumed. So I, I think if it were gold or platinum, I would probably say that's that there's more of a hardship there, but I feel like silver um, is, is doable within the codes that, that are being implemented in any case. Okay, so if I could sort of wrap up where we are with this, um, um, it seems that we're okay with the proposed language, um, except we would take out um, or the National Green Building, um, where it appears twice in the paragraph. Um, and we would add the provision that um, this uh, checklist submittal uh, uh, be done um, as a condition of and prior to the issuance of the uh, certificate of occupancy. Um, now I realize that uh, was, uh, uh, I think Mr. Kramer was saying that he thought that would create difficulties, um, but I'm thinking of enforcement. Um, so the, um, are the board members satisfied with that uh, change or, or, or do you want to change it before we move on fine with me sounds good to me I'm fine okay with all right then uh so we're all set with um issue um let's see that was uh, item number one right so we're all set with that we've come up with some language for that and i um, just like to uh, repeat or clarify that since this is beyond the stretch code we intend to do this, but uh, in terms of putting it as a condition of a certificate of occupancy, I would hate to spend X million dollars to build the building, have it be done, uh, be ready for occupancy, but because of some dispute or misunderstanding or something about uh, was that for good cause or not good cause to hold up the issuance of the certificate of occupancy. Roy. Roy, all I heard Gene say was that it be submitted before the C of O. Oh. If that's, that's what I heard Gene say. Submit to the board the checklist um, itemizing the lead criteria as they relate to the proposed building. The petitioner shall show, the checklist, of course, shall show that it has met except for good cause, et cetera, the lead silver standard. Right. So Paul, if it's submitted and, and some issue comes up, uh, we would still be entitled to a certificate of occupancy if everything else is satisfied. And we'd have to talk about resolution of whatever is not checked off. That's what that, I'm hearing. That, that's that or it, 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 can be, it, it could be also be linked into the bonding authority of the board. I mean, there are certain provisions that you can get occupancy fee, an occupancy permit for if the condition isn't completely satisfied, provided there is some kind of surety provided. So they, it could be linked to that. Well, I'd rather avoid that because then, as you know, you get into problems of, well, are you going to require a bond? How much? And if you haven't, yet figured out if there's compliance or not, it's uh, it's just open-ended. And it, it kind of, it takes on a life of its own. Uh, and if, you know, if everything else is done and we've submitted it, uh, I don't, you know, we have people ready to move in and all that stuff. I, I wouldn't want to have the whole occupancy issue um, uh, derailed because of some detail on a checklist for lead certification that's not required by the building code. Um, Natasha, yes. I, so I have a question. So I, I would assume that you would submit the submit it with when you get the building permit. So it would be way before the CFO? No, no it'd be before the CFO, but not 
before the building permit because okay. uh, if you haven't started any building yet, you don't know all of the. Well, but you have to submit the checklist. You have to. You have to. We have to. You know. You have to submit the checklist to say that before you build the building that you will be meeting the requirements, right? Oh, so then maybe this should be a link to the building permit and not the and not the not the occupancy permit. See, I don't know that I don't know the process like the, Natasha knows the process. No, I'm just asking. I mean, you, I, you can't do a checklist to say you've complied with something if you haven't built it yet. Sure, you, you do. We we do that all the time. We do the we we submit the um, to the client that that we're meeting it so that they know that they will meet it by the time they finish construction. You, you don't do the ch lead checklist during construction. You do the lead checklist during design. I'm supposing that the concern about um, not getting a building permit until you've provided this checklist that shows um, it has met the silver standard is that uh, with a renovation of an existing building, there could be things that come up um, that you can't anticipate at the building permit stage. And sure. thus- um, Right, but during the design, you you highlight what which ones you're meeting and- um, and that's how you determine. So there's all, all there are maybes, but there are yeses and nos. And so then you can kind of tell what you're proposing. But then that makes it even worse. Where you, you, we want, we're held for a standard that's not legally required. We intend to follow it, but we do, you know there's some unknowns, and we don't want this issue to derail a whole project. Okay, it's well, a requirement for the project, right? So you have to meet it. I don't understand. I mean, oh, legally, you're saying that the state doesn't require, but the town requires it. Well, the, 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 town, doesn't require, the town doesn't require lead certification. This <laughs> special permit is requiring this. Okay. This provision for lead. But the special permit, you're, you're going beyond what's required. So you're and we're willing to- This was something that was offered to us, Roy. This was in your presentation. No, we, we didn't- We're, just, we're, we're so. tracking your presentation. Your client has said he's fine with lead, sir. He's fine with the lead criteria. And, and sure. all I'm doing is putting out the issue that of course, we have to have a mechanism to enforce it. Well, and there, it, it's tied to the certificate of occupancy. We do that all the time with our conditions. Can I just ask my architect a question? Because a little over my bandwidth. Yeah. Um, and during the public hearing, I did say that other buildings achieve lead status, and that's what we tried to design to, and that's where the conversation stopped. Um, so there was just no further discussion there. Um, Anthony, for building permit, is it reasonable to have a checklist complete? You tell me. Um, that is the process for filing for lead. So th there's what is called, as we've talked about before, there's what's called the city of Boston, for example, will ask for a checklist up front. And they may, the, the city of Boston may say, we want you to be lead silver certifiable. This checklist is a way that essentially be, sets the design parameters for the construction project. <laughs> and then at the end of the Toward the end of the project, you would issue, uh, our office would issue an affidavit saying that we met those design parameters. So it is reasonable that we do the checklist up front. And then it, the, it, the only thing that would change, so if we do the checklist, there may be some assumptions we have to make because of what we don't know. Um, and if we run in, if those assumptions prove inaccurate, we can certainly communicate with the board during construction and alert them to that. Is that acceptable to the board? To do the to do this uh, if it's customary for building permit. Well, okay. it wouldn't. It it wouldn't. How would we word it? It says now shall show that it has met the lead silver. Change has to can can meet. Um, well, what what would want? then would be a two-stage submission, one at the beginning and what uh, yeah, the the on the move and I would on the suggest wording, that there's a second stage to it's make sure compliance from the architect. Yeah. So um, if it's going to be two stages 
and we can certainly provide for that. Yes, so you're basically doing the checklist before the for the building permit and you're doing the the affidavit certification prior to the occupancy permit. I wait a minute. This is saying submit to the board the checklist. Does the checklist go to the board or to the building inspector? The board. Okay. Board. So, so that's in that's in the first sentence. Okay. So submitting it prior to the building permit that's in the first sentence mm -hmm. the checklist shall submit to the board prior to the issuance of the building permit checklist prepared by the project architect itemizing the lead or green itemizing the lead criteria as they relate to the proposed building then we go out then we have the petitioner shall show that he that it has met the mm -hmm. lead standard mm -hmm. except for good cause shown. So the question is, what's the timing for that? Gene is concerned that we need to have a timing in there in order to enforce it. And the only way to do that is at the C of O stage. Right. Can somebody that's, tell that's how we do it for the city of yeah, that's how we do it for the city of Boston. We, we show them, we show them the lead checklist. This is what we're assuming that we're you know, this is what we're proposing we're doing to meet lead silver and then once we finish construction and everything has been approved and everything then you have the affidavit saying we complied mm -hmm. before, before you, you get, get your certificate of occupancy correct yes so roy that's the way it's done that's the way we're going to do it okay okay all right so um that's so uh, lee are you satisfied uh, that you have the wording uh there on that Yes, I'm satisfied. Okay, so now we're moving on to what the applicant characterized as the most important issues. Uh, and first uh, was item four, um, having to do with the change of the entity operating the facility. Um, and um, I, it, we do uh, have a process typically uh, when you have a change uh, in, a, in a project that has been approved by special permit um, of a change in the operation of the facility. Typical, isn't this typical, uh, Lee? Would you address this and the reason why we have this and uh, whether it makes sense in this case where, as was pointed out, any new operator has to also be approved by the state? This is, a, this is a standard condition that the board has been imposing for like facilities that are currently operating in Needham. This was the requirement that um, was imposed for Wingate, for their nursing facility, for their assisted living facility. It's a standard that's in place um, for the uh, memory care facility on Greendale Avenue. It's included, I think, within the North Hill decision. It's a standard provision um, that the board is imposed for these kinds of activities and uses um, historically. I think the reason for it was they wanted to understand who was operating it. They wanted to, there are certain rep representations that have been made in terms of how it's gonna be operated. Um, and so if there were any changes in that operational schematic, I think the board wanted to be informed of it and wanted to be ensured that it was continued to operate um, by an organization of the caliber that was had presented the original special permit under which um, the special permit was issued. So it's been historically done um, for these kinds of uses. And the board also uses it for food uses, um, restaurant uses, for example, um, have a provision comparable to this incorporated in all of their special permits. Well, I, I, I'd like right, to- Thank you. And Roy, if you would uh, explain, uh, or, or um, Mr. Huber or, or Mr. Bloom, uh, uh, but, but, why why this is such a big problem for you, or why you? Well, first of all, um, I've had several cases over the years, usually with bigger projects, where um, businesses uh, and and real estate are periodically sold, you know, certain kinds of industries, and um, and I have asked for that on occasion. Uh, I think I asked, you know, it's hard to remember after all these years, but I think I asked for it in Normandy Real Estate Partners, um, where uh, 
you know, if they want to sell the building or, you know, some kind of operation, it's a big enough project that, um, you know, this is a 200,000 square foot project that if, if, a, if a major sale uh, is um, being held up for approval by the board, not a change of any operation because all of your conditions in this permit run with the land. So it would just be, you know, company A versus company B operating the, the same facility. Um, and the state has to certify that, you know, that uh, company B is, is okay. But to have uh, you do it, uh, that's double work. And, you know, what expertise do you have? Is it really the correct function of site plan review? You know, we're primarily concerned with what's parking, what's traffic, uh, what's the FAR, what does the landscaping look like, and not who happens to be, you know, running the operation or owning the real estate. And I know that in some cases, you have uh, not put that uh, provision in. And I, I noticed that in, for this property itself, uh, it was first permitted in 1993 when Mediplex bought it from the Carter Company. And if you read that decision, as well as the amendments after that, it's not included for this property. So the, there are exceptions. And I, I remember when we were first discussing this issue uh, about you need permission from the board. Uh, in, the, in the late 90s, there was a planning board member named Paul Colleen. And he made the argument in the context of restaurants in the center business district that he said, you know, if we like a, you know, a proposed owner and operator and we, 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 he has a flair and he's sophisticated and you know it's gonna be a nice place you know, and well run. Um, he wanted to have this kind of paragraph so that person wouldn't sell to a guy in a t-shirt who you know, is gonna do very basic stuff and change the whole character of the restaurant. So that's, you know, that was the impetus from him back in, back in the 90s. Something like this, where you know it's independent living and it's uh, uh, you know memory care and assisted, it, it's not dependent on one person who who may or may not have a flair for a service thing like the restaurant, and um, so that's why I think it's um, uh, it it really shouldn't be there, and it also has uh, potential adverse consequences. Uh, in financing issues uh, and just real estate issues and also introduces a whole element of politics where <clears throat> I'm not worried if the five of you are still here 10 years from now and you're gonna make the decision, but you don't know who's gonna be on the board in 10 years or 15 years or whenever it happens. And you don't know the quality of the people. You don't know if they're gonna have another agenda you know, we just went through, as you know, a very unpleasant rezoning uh, where a lot of things were said um, about the project and about the people that really weren't so. And if you have the planning board have the approval rights, you open up a whole can of worms. And I'm not gonna name any names, but you know, things have gotten very polarized and very difficult in the country and in Needham. And since the state is licensing us and certifying the new people, and, and we're tied to, the, to this, all these uses and these restrictions, I think it's, um, that's why we think it's so important that that approval right uh, is not in this decision. And I uh, sense that, Ms., um, uh, that um, Attorney uh, Giannakis also uh, wishes to address us on this subject, yes. And uh, this, Mr. Huber said she would like to, uh, Yes, thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you know, I, I just want to echo what Roy and Evans have previewed here on behalf of Well Tower. I'm Louise Giannakis, counsel to Well Tower, the owner. Um, 
you know, we, we really see this as sort of beyond the purview of the planning board. And we certainly understand that you all wanna know your neighbors and, and trust who's operating the facility. And we can completely, um, you know, agree with that and are more than happy to maintain a dialogue and provide information as to potential new operators. But from a, a practical standpoint and just, you know, a, a real estate perspective, this has an extremely chilling effect on financing consequences. Um, you know, certainly now, but also in the future, if it comes time to refinance or to sell the asset, um, you know, there, as, as Evans and Roy mentioned, there are multiple other avenues by which a new operator can be vetted. Um, the Executive Office of Elder Affairs does a very extensive certification process, as I'm sure you're all aware. Um, and the special permit, you know, will continue to run with the land and and a new owner would be, or a new operator would be subject to all of those conditions in the special permit. Um, so we certainly understand the reasoning and we're, you know, very happy to, you know, provide notice and provide as much information as we reasonably can if, if we are looking at a new operator. But, you know, after such a lengthy permitting process on which we've made so much progress, which we really appreciate, um, unfortunately, this is a really a major issue for both Well Tower and I know for LCB as well. Thank you, um, J Marty Jacobs. Yeah, I just want to say um, I completely agree with Roy and Attorney Giannakis. I I have never understood that what we're doing is um, vetting a successor operator that has never well we're not qualified to do that and i don't ever understand that we've done that what we have done is, as a sort of a partial measure that in my view was never really necessary anyway was we've asked for the incoming operator to sign some document that says i've read all these the decision with all the restrictions and limitations, and I agree to abide by all of those. That's what we've done. And the reason I think even that is totally unnecessary is because as both Roy and Louise say, all these conditions on that everything that's in the decision runs with the land. So right. it, it is unnecessary, but it's a belt and suspenders, I suppose. So I don't have any problem with it. But the whole concept that we're vetting the successor operator to make sure they're competent to do this or they have a flair, I think it's silly. I don't think it's true. Um, thank you, um, Marty. Uh, Adam. I, uh, I concur with Marty. I don't really see our job is to regulate um, ownership. It's to regulate uh, the size, uh, dimensions, use, and certainly the impact. I don't see that our job is uh, to to regulate um, uh, ownership. Um, uh, I can see it in a sense with alcohol service uh, where licenses may or may not always be transferred uh, to a, a person of competent skill. Um, uh, being in the real estate business myself, I certainly understand the impact this has um, uh, for ownership and for financing. Um, but most importantly, I, I concur with, uh, with what Marty was saying that it's not our purview to be able to effectively and really properly vet uh, um, an elder services provider where there is another state agency whose sole responsibility is to do precisely that, who have the precise qualifications to be able to do that while we don't. I don't think that that's really part of our job. Uh, and so I, uh, I, I agree. Paul, Paul Albert. I don't like comments to, to the lawyers here is very persuasive argument counselors. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I even meant I, it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but do you have a problem with um, something that Marty suggested, which is just that on the transfer of ownership, the new owner shall file a statement with the board that the owner has read the decision. 
that's as far as I want to go. I just want to know that the owner knows that the decision is there and knows what it says. I'm good if Louise is good. Yeah, so to, I, I, don't, I don't have a problem with, uh, with that. Um, in fact, that's what we used to do with the Conservation Commission years ago. That's uh, what I'm remembering. Yeah, because uh, <laughs> so, no new buyer. Nobody knows, yeah, nobody, nobody knows, knows what the requirements are. Yeah, um, so, uh, you know, to have the new owner <clears throat> write a letter to the board saying he's read and understands this decision. Yeah. You know, make reference to it. No um, acknowledgement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, then- No, uh, means he that. or she has read. That's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> he, she, or they. <laughs> he, he, she, right. Yeah, my apologies. Uh, Louise, All right. Well, it sounds like we're going in that direction. Yes. Yes. Um, I, I agree with that suggestion very much. All right. Um, I just want to say that I think the motivation of the town in something like this, uh, especially with the senior housing type uh, uses, is we perceive these uses as serving a public purpose. And I think the initial uh, approval of this rezoning by town meeting was an indication that the town sees a use like this as serving a public purpose in our town. And we wanna make sure that that service goes on. And that's the whole idea behind this. Um, but I think we're, we're achieving a compromise here. Of course, the conditions and the conditions are very tight regarding the type of things that are to happen in this building and how is the space to be used. Um, and I realize there's some flexibility built in as to the assisted living that you can change from one to the other and that's built in. Um, so, um, so it sounds like as long as we're provided with notice of who is the intended um, uh, buyer of the, not of the real property, correct? We're talking about the operator who is a lessee under the owner. Is it, that's who we're talking about, right? That's correct. Um, so I'm, and I'm that, that, that that party who's going to come in and operate understands the conditions under which they have to operate. Right, the, oper the operator will. Right. So, Lee, can you reword that? Uh, okay, did you get, did you yeah, get I that? Understand what, I understand what the intent is. Yeah. All right, then. I think we have gone down the list and uh, that, so now we have a decision with the changes discussed tonight that um, is satisfactory to the board and um, we don't it doesn't meet with um, objection from the uh, applicant um, so we have two um, two votes ahead of us uh, one going back to the application and I think uh, that relief that is uh, sought is spelled out in um, um, Let's see, I'm looking at the decision. Page eight. Page, yeah, I got it. Page eight, there it is. I right. got it, and I'm willing to Therefore, the open. board voted to grant. Yeah. All right, so we need a motion to that, and then- well, I will, I will recite vote. the motion, but with the caveat that on the assumption that I'm voted the incoming, the chair, somebody else is gonna have to pick this up in the future. <laughs> <laughs> so. All right. <laughs> okay. I, I move that the board grant the requested major project site plan review special permit under section 7.4 of the bylaw. And I further move that we grant the requested special permit under section 1.4.6 of the bylaw for the alteration of a lawful pre existing non conforming structure. And I further move that we grant the requested special permit under section 3.15.3.2 B, C, and D of the bylaw to operate assisted living and or Alzheimer's slash memory loss facilities, independent living apartments and buildings with multiple uses containing as a primary use, such uses as are allowed by special permit or by right in the Avery Square Overlay District or the Avery Square Business District. And I move that the board grant the requested special permit under section 5.1.1.5 to waive strict adherence with the requirements of section 5.1.3 parking, parking plan design requirements of the zoning bylaw, more specifically in section 5.1.3H to waive the parking space layout standard, which requires that all parking areas 
be designed so that each motor vehicle may proceed to and from its parking space without requiring the movement of any other vehicle and to approve in the alternative five tandem parking spaces within the parking garage as shown on the plan and in section 5.1.3 I to waive the maneuvering aisle width standard which requires a minimum maneuvering aisle width of 24 feet for 90 degree parking spaces and to approve in the alternative a maneuvering aisle width of 16 to 18 feet within the parking garage as shown on the plan all subject to the modifications conditions and limitations set forth in our decision i hope we you have a motion that was so second we have a motion and a second is there further discussion a call for a vote mr jacobs vote aye mr alpert aye Ms. nespada aye um, uh, mr block aye and the chair is aye, uh, so that relief is granted. Uh, so now uh, we need a motion with regard to the decision. I move that we um, accept and issue the decision as presented to us with the um, um, minor changes pre previously uh, submitted to the planning director and with the modifications agreed to this evening. So I can second. So we have a motion and a second uh, to approve the decision with those modifications. Uh, any further discussion? Okay, hearing none, it's time for the vote. Um, Mr. Jacobs. Aye. Mr. Alpert. Aye. Mrs. Parra. Aye. Um, Mr. Block. Aye. And the chair is aye, so that uh, decision is approved as modified. Right. Uh, thank, thank you all you. very much for your very much. work and tolerance for all this. And Lee, thank you very much for all your hard work. Really appreciate all Absolutely. Of we all appreciate it. And I know that the town as a whole, its residents very much look forward to seeing this important building, this historic building, be renovated yeah. for this for this use. Thank you. Well, well Tower and LCB are very excited to be doing this. So again, thanks. Look forward to seeing y'all. You'll see us <laughs> in a good way, I hope. So you 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 may see some of us applying for apartments. So <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> all right. Thank you all very thank much. Thank you very much. Thank Best you. of luck. Best of luck. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Uh, so the only board of appeals. Um, it was a um, ADU, an ADU, um, and it's going to be a new, newly constructed building with an ADU for somebody's mother. Um, I, I propose no comment. I agree. I second that proposal. Okay, I so agree. we don't really need to vote, right? We just uh, do we do we customarily vote and say no? Yes, you do. All right, then um, I will take. Mr. Upward's agreement as the motion. And is there a second? Second. All right, so moved and second. That would be no comment. Um, so, um, Mr. Jacobs. Three, no comment. Mr. Alpert. Aye. Aye. Mrs. Bada. Aye. Mr. Block. Aye. And the chair is aye, so no comment on the uh, zoning board of appeals. Now, um, it's quarter of 10, uh, but we have a bunch of minutes that we can take care of. We've, you know, the um, staff is sort of caught up on minutes um, and I've reviewed all of them and made some red lines. Uh, there are a couple of little things that I, I just was uncertain of. And I, so as I go through them, I'd, I'd like to just um, ask a couple of questions. I don't think it'll take too long. Should we go forward with this? I think there's five sets of minutes. All right. Um, the first set is June 8th, 2020. So it's almost a year ago. And um, I made some red line changes, nothing, nothing substantive. Um, is there a motion to accept the minutes of June 8th, 2020? Moved. So moved. Second. Second. So we have moved. And let me let me say I believe it is true that a new member 
who was not a member at the time of the meeting may still vote on acceptance of minutes. Um, really? is, that the, is that the practice? <laughs> we, uh, uh, what do we usually do with regard to votes of minutes? Usually, members? if a member isn't at the meeting, they abstain. They abstain, um, yeah. All right. I we'll prefer we'll to abstain just because I don't really know what I'm voting for. Okay, well, we'll follow that practice in the minutes so that uh, Albert Block McKnight, let's see, and Jacobs, who was the who was chair at that time, I believe. You were, you were chair at that time. Yeah, time. These were old minutes. That this time. is really going back. Yeah. So so I guess the four of us can vote now. Uh, the, the motion has been made and seconded. Um, and maybe I already started calling for it. But anyway, let me do it again. Mr. Jacobs. Aye. Uh, Mr. Albert. Aye. Um, Mr. Block. Aye. And the chair is aye. So we get those June 8th minutes accepted. Uh, now we have the June 16th minutes. Um, and on the second page, um, and this has to do with discussion of 100 West Street, the very project we were discussing tonight. Um, and we had some discussion of the proposed zoning, and then uh, there was a vote, and then the minutes say, Ms. Newman will put this on an agenda. Th then it says, it will go to the selectmen to be referred back to the planning board. So I think what she meant is, Ms. Newman will put this on an agenda for public hearing. Does that make sense to you, Lee? Yeah, that okay. makes sense. So I put that in with a question mark, but let's just uh, make that change. Um, and otherwise uh, there were no substantive changes or questionable changes. Um, okay, just give a check mark on that. So uh, in the minutes of June 16, um, uh, Mark, Mark Jacobs chaired that uh, meeting and um, Alpert and Block and McKnight were there. Um, so do I have a motion to uh, accept the minutes of June 16th with that. I'm, I move we accept the minutes of June 16th with the one change that was just discussed. And that has been seconded. So now we have a vote. Mr. Jacobs. Mr. Albert. Aye. Mr. Block. Aye. And the chair is aye. Uh, oh, wait a minute. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Just one thing. Oh, brother. I'm just going to let that alone. There was another thing that I said was not clear, but I'm just going to leave it alone. Okay, we're not, we're not going to vote that again. It's just leave it alone. Okay, so we have a vote. So we have the vote. Um, the chair is I also. We have the vote to accept the minutes of June 16th. Um, so then um, we, the next uh, set of minutes is uh, more recent. Um, and so we have, um, I guess, three more sets, uh, starting with June 19, and um, by that time I was chair, um, and it was attended by Jacobs, Alpert, and Block. Um, and I had two questions. Um, we were discussing the Highway Commercial One rezoning, as we were so often during that time period. Um, and um, Adam was uh, presenting uh, what we would be, uh, what, would we, what would be presenting at the upcoming uh, community meeting. Um, and he said, there'd be about 45 minutes of content from consultants and about 45 minutes of questions. He's hoping GPI can present in less than 15 minutes. Then there's a sentence, Miss Newman stated there are no cost estimates. It's not clear what that relates to. Uh, should that just be deleted or elaborated on? I think I probably was referring to cost estimates for the um, roadway improvements. Um, I, honestly I honestly don't recall. I would probably strike it. Yeah. Um, okay. Strike it. Okay. Um, we we'll just strike that. So um, with that, so we have that one change. Then there, um, on the next page, uh, we're talking about um, 
the Honeywell Street, um, the eight unit apartment building. Um, and um, let's see, it, it, in the middle of the paragraph, it says, the FAR is half of the building across the street. Okay. Uh, we noted that, we note that, that, you know, this is the um, applicant uh, speaking or his attorney. And then it says, he noted this is not an appropriate issue as the project is in keeping with the zoning bylaw. What does he mean by this? Presumably FAR, since that was what was discussed in the prior sentence. You think it's fair to say he to change this to FAR? So it would say he noted FAR is not an appropriate issue as the project is in keeping with the zoning bylaw. Who does the he refer to? Uh, Marty, yeah, who can't hear you. Refer to? What is he referring to? What project? What no, he he's asking who who is the he? Oh, uh, it is uh, Mr. Junta, the attorney Junta. Yeah, then I think what your substitution makes sense. To change it to FAR. Yeah, because I think that he was referring to that issue when he said this. Okay, so those are the two uh, changes that I wasn't sure about. Um, and now that we have made those, um, a motion uh, for the acceptance of the January 19, 2021 minutes. Somebody move that? So moved. So moved by Second. Mr. Block, seconded by Mr. Alpert. Uh, so the vote, uh, Marty Jacobs. Aye. Paul Alpert. Aye. Adam Block. Aye. And the chair is aye. So we have those minutes accepted. Um, and then uh, we have the minutes of January 21, 2021. Um, oh, there's just a, a word that I just don't understand. The person writing the minutes must have just misheard something, but I don't know what word is intended. This is, all right, this is, um, this is again talking about Highway Commercial 1. Um, and it, 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 it starts out with Ms. Brown of GPI, um, showed a slideshow. She'll explain the trip generation. She's shown there are capacity constraints that need mitigation. And then it says the mail, M-A-I-L, level e or f is hunting and highland what word was meant um i would strike that just strike the whole sentence yeah she has shown where the uh where yeah the it may the, the, the paragraph does fine without that sentence okay is that okay with others sure all right, so we strike that sentence. Um, so with that change, um, and I, that's the only one that needs discussion, although we have one more set of minutes to, to present. Um, so uh, a motion to accept the minutes of January 21, 2021. So moved. Second. second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Um, a vote now. Um, Marty Jacobs. Aye. Paul Alpert. Aye. Adam Block. Aye. And the chair is I, so we have those minutes accepted. And now it's simply um, to accept the minutes, if we have a motion to accept the minutes uh, as, as we're in your packets of February 2, February 2 uh, 2021. And uh, um, let's see, I was the chair, Albert, Jacobs, and Block were at the meeting. So, um, so uh, do I have a motion? So moved. Motion to accept February 2nd, 2021. Do we have a second? Marty seconded. Marty seconded. Okay. Uh, call for a vote. Marty Jacobs. Aye. Paul Alpert. Aye. Adam Block. Aye. Chair is aye. So we have that accepted. Well, good. We've caught up on a lot of minutes. Um, so then as far as any discussion, I think there were only uh, two... Were there 
we still have kind of left over and not dealt with um, the racial equity statement for the town of Needham. It wasn't in our packets for tonight, but we should not forget and, and just keep, you know, we should not forget to put this in our packet for a, one of our upcoming June meetings. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, then, um, Jean, excuse me, Madam Chair, um, I'm on Nuari. If anyone has any questions, um, I was part of the committee that, that worked on it. So um, I have information if you need additional information. Well, Great, very you. good. Yeah. I'm only saying, I mean, it's almost 10 that we probably, uh, if we want to. We, we don't need to do it tonight. I just wanted yeah, to no, let no, you know. I think exactly. Time. That's so useful to remember that. From what I understand, the June 1 meeting right now, the agenda is pretty light. So it might be good to, to put it in for the June 1 meeting because June 15 is going to be a long meeting. Oh. Lee, we can't Lee, hear you. You're, you're muted. muted, Lee. Sorry, I try to keep rid of the, to eliminate the background sounds um, generally. Um, but I was just going to say the June 1 meeting, I'm going to try to focus that on, on trying to identify the planning studies that we want to move forward with for the course over the course of the next year. So a big chunk of that meeting is going to be dedicated to that purpose. But we, we can certainly add this as another item. For the yep. June first meeting, that makes a lot of sense. And in connection with the issue of well, planning studies over the uh, next year, um, there is a piece of correspondence in our uh, in our packets from um, Stephen Frail, who, as you may recall, was a proponent of an amendment um, uh, on the uh, Highway Commercial One, um, and his amendment would have gone to having more stringent uh, green building standards apply. In, at, at, to that in that uh, district, um, and he looks. He, he very much looks forward to working with the planning board. Uh, he congratulates the planning board on the passage of the HC one rezoning, um, and he urges the planning board. Would love to see the planning board continue to work on the issue of pushing harder for sustainable development. And Lee, I think that is on your list of uh, planning issues, is it not? Yes, it is. Yes. Okay. So uh, that takes care of our agenda. Um, and I know it wasn't expressly on our agenda, but we did have an expectation and this is the time of year. Um, I've, we... got, I've got some, at least oh, one thing. I should have asked, sorry. Um, yeah. Remind me if I'm, cause I'm thinking that there were two, but I. Yes, well, there were two, but I think I, I answered your question on the other one earlier. Um, the, I think the, you want the appointment for the CPC voted on and the reorganization. No, but I, I want to mention the, the CPC. So yeah. I have been the planning board CPC uh, community preservation committee representative for the past six years. Um, the terms of the community preservation committee are three year terms. So my term is up and the town in its wisdom when we pass the CPC bylaw put in a term limitation of two terms. So I am term limited. So mm -hmm. we need to have a planning board member. I checked the statute and it does require that it be a planning board member take my place. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just raising it tonight. It is late. I'm throwing it out there and I'll, and, and we'll raise it again at the, hopefully the June one meeting. Mm -hmm. um, if somebody is willing to volunteer to take my place or uh, have somebody be volunteered. Um, we can we can take it up at the June one meeting. I do know because uh, still being a member, I'm getting the emails. They are trying to put together uh, two or three summer uh, meetings because um, there will be uh, CPC items in the fall town meeting. At least Emory Grover is going to be there. And I don't know if there'll be other applications, um, but um, so so um, we need to have somebody take my place in, in time to to attend the first summer meeting, which might be later in June. So if you guys would think about who's willing to to take my place on that, um, 
And is it true, Paul, that I know that the deadline for applications is in December sometime? Yeah, so but, 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 but I think, I, you know, there's something in the back of my mind that says that there was something, some other application besides Emory Grover, which was tabled. Um, mm -hmm. That the, Yeah, the, there was. The, I don't the remember CBC what it was. He was agreeing to to possibly bring at the at the November um, at the October town meeting, mm -hmm. but em Emory Grover is going to take a lot of discussion, and you know, and there will be a vote. So, mm -hmm. and then, um, but other than that, um, the the heavy work of this uh, community preservation committee does it tend to be in the midwinter uh, and leading up? Uh, yes, the applications. We do have a meeting before the December one deadline um and then after december one there are meetings to discuss the applications that come in and then there are presentations and hearings so so the bulk of the work is really um uh, a little bit in december not too heavy in december but january february march leading up the town meeting yeah so that's the time of year Okay, well, I'm sure we'll all uh, consider uh, our interest in um, community preservation and the various work that it that it does. Both I'll mention right now, space, historic Marty, preservation. Marty has expressed housing. that he's not going to run for re-election, so it doesn't make sense for Marty to volunteer because it has to be a planning board member. He'd only be there for one year. Uh huh. Uh -huh. So yeah. that leaves yeah. the other three of you. <laughs> Maybe uh. Us, huh? Uh, let me ask you, um, Adam, I know you've been on the um, Council of Economic Advisors. What is your role in that Council of Economic Advisors presently? So I was actually going to bring up, uh, if uh, Paul has done a, a couple of items relating to the CEA, so I appreciate the opportunity to chat to it. So I'm currently chair of the CEA and have been for a couple of years. Uh, this year, we've... Um, uh, I've changed a bit of the, the meeting structure in a pretty substantial way. I've, uh, uh, in, instead of meeting every month, we've been, uh, I've kind of subdivided the CEA into three different categories with three different subcommittees, one of which is to look at small business in town. The other is to look to a district focused kind of rezoning. So we would look at, um, uh, different areas, uh, 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 different zoning districts, and identify and to be able to present through the select board to the planning board, um, you know, any areas that, you know, that, uh, that could be improved and how, but not ever to go to what had been done under a prior staff person and get ahead of the skis, so to speak. Um, and the third, uh, which I was wondering actually if Lakshmi, our new, uh, one of our new select board members might be very helpful with, the third committee is a cluster-based economic development committee, subcommittee. And the purpose of it is to identify different categories within the economy, different sectors, and ask the question, what do you need in the life cycle of that cluster to enable growth, and what are the priority sectors that uh, can lead with higher paying jobs or more jobs in town? And when I say lead with higher paying jobs, that if there are businesses that we attract to town that have some executive positions, they also have mid management and and um, you know and early entry jobs as well. So so a company can move here; it may produce. 50 jobs or 250 jobs and in the course of doing that those jobs range from forty thousand dollars a year salaries to you know hundreds of thousands of dollars salaries life uh life sciences is one category for instance intellectual property is another category for instance and there are others still so so the um so we've broken the CEA down and we're supposed to be meeting on a monthly basis through these subcommittees. 
and then quarterly as a full CEA to report back on the progress of the subcommittees. So it's become more involved than it had been before. Um, and uh, um, one of the things that, that one, I identify that uh, one of the districts um, that the district focused subcommittee is interested in is Needham Center. And I think Lee, you've talked about some, um, some activities that have been happening. Basically the CEA has through the pandemic looked at this as a high priority area in particular because of the sheer number of vacancies, which is understandable for a few reasons. One of which is short term, but devastating, which is the impact of the pandemic on business. And the other is online business mm -hmm. continues to cripple uh, various kinds of retail. Um, and the, uh, um, the, the, re, the district focused um, uh, subcommittee is actually looking to hold uh, a meeting, um, uh, which I wanted to bring to everyone's attention. We're trying to schedule it for Tuesday, May 25th at 8.30 a.m. So that's Tuesday, May 25th at 8.30 a.m. And the purpose of that meeting is we've invited a number of retail uh, resident, uh, retail um, commercial brokers and some investors to come in and, and to discuss a whole range of issues and identify some potential challenges and solutions for the downtown. Part of these issues are regional issues and national, but part of them, part of those issues may be local. And it's something for, um, uh, for the town, you know, to consider. Uh, so, well, yeah, that this is important because it also ties in uh, to the meeting we're we're having on June one, talking about our planning initiatives over the coming year. And I know um, a discussion of uh, Needham Center and Chestnut Street exactly. is on that list, and it it very much ties into the future of retail um, in our center. So that's good. Yeah. So I, I, I would. I just, want to ask uh, so I know uh, what is your uh, your uh, status on the Council of Economics Advisors you you've been on that for many years so you were appointed um, by who appoints the members of this uh, select board the select board and then in the past year have you simply continued under that appointment or are you our planning board representative? So I've continued under that appointment and I think it would probably serve a benefit since I have continuity on the files on both sides. I'd be happy to be the uh, planning board representative to yeah. this DA. Is there a planning board representative? Is that part yeah. of it? I thought the... I, I was assuming there was, but I thought the CEA was was a committee set up by the select board to report to the select board. It is. Okay. I was, I was is that right, Lee? There's no Marty. We're having trouble hearing you. Your mic is very very low. I was the planning board representative on the CEA for several years, and then Ted came on the board, the CEA. Actually, at the same time, I was still there, and then I dropped off. And Ted was on it for years, right, Lee? Yes, yeah, so we, we, the planning board has a representative on that committee. Okay. But the okay. only representative right now is Adam, I think. All right, well, maybe it would be a good idea to um, firm up that status um, of Adam having that role as yeah. the planning board rep, would it? Yeah, I can coordinate that with the town manager's office um, in, terms of, in terms of looking at the who uh, at the appointing authorities and making any adjustments for Adam's position if, if it's warranted. Okay, all right. Um, okay, so that thank you for that report on um, the work that's being done and it sounds like a bit of a reorganization of the, uh, the CEA. Um, so um, we'll, we'll follow up certainly on June 1 uh, to talk about the appointee for the Community Preservation Committee. Is there any other committee uh, that the planning board uh, serves on? I can't think of it. 
We no, have, I think we that's, appoint people. We appoint people, and there are some appointments that are up, and Alex and I are going to be reaching out to the people who are service, serving in those positions to see if they're interested in reserving. reserving. So you, we, have, we have some appointments that are coming up on July 1st. Um, and we'll put that on the agenda for a meeting in June, um, what, those, what those positions are that are rotating um, and need reappointments going into the next fiscal year. So yeah, that's- For the example, the Transportation Committee. I'm aware yes, of that because my husband, say Steve, is uh, the rep for the planning board on that. That's right. And I think, and, and the Design Review Board. So- um, mm -hmm. So okay. Lee, Lee, on that list of- um, that list of planning issues that we're going to discuss at the June one meeting. Do you, do you have the um, uh, zoning bylaw for affordable housing to to visit? Oh, oh, inclusionary zoning. Yes. Yes. Yes, that that's on the list. I mean, this I, I'm going to pull it really basically from the memo that I prepared for the finance committee. Mm -hmm. um, which Jean and I then augmented for her presentation to town meeting, where we identified um, where that sixty thousand dollars might be utilized, which included, you know, looking at doing a, a really a comprehensive housing plan. Um, certainly, inclusionary zoning is just one component of an overall affordable housing strategy. So, I think one um, item on there was to actually develop a. A, a revised and updated affordable housing plan of which inclusionary zoning would be one piece of it that we would take forward in the spring. Um, we also talked about looking at the Chestnut Street quarter, um, the zoning plan for that and whether there, what the, um, whether there are any dimensional requirements in particular or parking standard requirements in particular that were getting in the way of redevelopment because that had been identified in the yeah, 20. No, I just, I just wanted to make sure because I made some promises at town meeting about yes. affordable housing and about the um and, and about energy the, efficiency the, uh, yeah i think it's important to move forward with the with an affordable housing plan yeah. um and i think i think this board well, needs to coordinate with the board of selectmen what that moving forward looks like right we'll discuss that at the june one meeting then yes because it is getting late yeah so i so i guess the the reorganization that uh, I must say I've been looking forward to is uh, something we'll end this meeting with. Well, I need to ask for one thing. I just want to update people. I've been working with the town manager's office um, on outdoor seating in particular, because I don't remember we kind of waived all of our rules to allow restaurants to put outdoor seating in during the pandemic. Um, and there've been a number of restaurants that have taken advantage of that. And so now that the um, pandemic is, 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 is ending, the question is how do we convert them over to the existing regulatory framework? And mm -hmm. are there some changes that we need to make in, in terms of our existing rules for outdoor seating to allow them to go forward with some of the implementations that happened during COVID? Um, and in particular, um, what's happening is they've, um, the current rules don't allow placement of um, seating on parking spaces within existing lots as of right, um, for example, or some of the restaurants have gone beyond their 30% capacity for outdoor seating. Um, so we're in the process of looking at what restaurants have implemented, trying to figure out what their goals are moving forward after COVID-19, and then kind of looking at the regulatory framework to make sure that it's consistent with what our, what our revised or maybe updated policy goals are. So to that end, um, there's a small working group that's being created to with um, members from the select board, I think possibly the CEA um, is being orchestrated through Amy and they'd like two planning <coughs> members just to kind of participate with uh, probably a series of th a total of three meetings, um, which would include conversations with some of the restaurant owners um, to figure out what is appropriate in terms of regulatory adjustments. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at for two volunteers, um, something I see Adam's got his hand up are you volunteering, Adam? Yes, I've got both hands up. Natasha, you want to jump in on this and the uh, CPC? Wait, wait, the CPC, the thing is I'm in Nuari for another year. So, um, but this, uh, this is, you're talking about looking at the restaurants and is that the one that you just nominated? Yes. Me for? And it's yes. sort of an ad hoc group. But by that, I mean, it's not a continuing committee right. to address this issue. It's a very, very short-term commitment. I think it yeah. probably 
Yeah, no, definitely. The CPC, I just feel like uh, because New Ari is going on for another year and I didn't know that they had nominated for me again for that. I just feel like I'm a little spread yeah. a little too thin. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. When will when will these meetings occur? They'll be they'll be really soon, correct? Soon they'll probably be Marianne Cooley is gonna be part of the group and she likes 8 a.m. 8 a.m. meetings. So it will be whatever day it's held, it will be at 8 a.m. So oh, my goodness. <laughs> 8 a.m. meetings. But what I mean is, uh, we're basically talking about the next two months uh, to get this in place. Or? Yeah, I think probably the next two months. I think it's that's a quick yeah. We've, we've Alex has been working on this, and we've we've reviewed all the permits that were issued during COVID, and we've compared that against the regulatory framework we have now. We've identified essentially what would need to be modified if we want to codify some of what's already occurred. So. I think it would be great. It works really well in a lot of cases, so it would be good to be able to review. Well, that would be wonderful, Natasha. You'd bring a lot to that effort, as would Adam, yeah. because of his uh, experience, uh, and, and particularly his background with the Council of Economic Advisors, and you know, was already concerned about this. Okay, well, thank you, too. Okay, good. Sorry, Natasha. No, I wanted to do this. I just I'm just mindful of wanting to do a good job, so I don't want to overcommit myself, especially because I, I didn't. Uh, Nuari was supposed to end in June, and um, and they just extended it for another year, and and then everybody said we're so happy that you'll be representing the planning board. I was I was trying to get off of it, and they <laughs> so I feel like. But anyway, looking forward to it. Okay. Anything else? Uh that anybody wants to bring up right now That's it. all right there we go so uh how do we handle this reorganization business um I I, we, chair. we have been in you know we have used a rotation uh system to uh, decide who the next chair is and uh, the person next in that rotation is paul alpert uh, who has been a wonderful vice chair to me. I couldn't have got through this year without Paul's support, both in the uh, chair vice chair meetings that we have with Lee to prepare for our meetings, the knowledge that if I really fell apart during a meeting, he'd be right there to back me up. And then the occasion- Oh, I'm here to take over, G. <laughs> <laughs> take over. And also, you know, and Marty does this too. Oh, you forgot to ask for the motion for this or that, you know, as we go along. And, oh, no, yes, please, we need that motion. Um, I, I, I very much appreciate um, that, that correction as we go along. Um, so I, um, I, I'm expecting that everybody um, and that Paul is willing and everybody is happy to have Paul. Why don't I do it as a motion? Be our chair for the coming year. Be formal about it. I, I, I will move that uh, Paul Alpert be our next chair of the planning board, commencing immediately. All right. Do I have okay. a second? And Adam seconds that. All right. Uh, so, um, any any discussion? He, don't do this to me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, the motion that Paul Alpert uh, be our chair for the coming year, um, I'll call for a vote. Uh, Mr. Jacobs. Aye. Mr. Block. Aye. Mrs. Espada. Aye. And Mr. Alpert. Aye. <laughs> and the chair is aye with great enthusiasm. All right. And I would bring another motion. I will move that Adam Block be our next vice chair commencing immediately for one year. So I second that motion. All right, we have a motion and a second that Adam Block uh, be our vice chair. And um, so uh, there's this, any discussion needed on that? And uh, it, it, from the smile on his face, it looks like he's willing to accept that position. Um. Oh. Trouble. <laughs> now, this is. <laughs> now this becomes serious. Time to quit All your right. job, Adam. Yeah. Mr. Jacobs. Aye. Mr. Alpert. Aye. Mrs. Pada. Aye. 
Uh, Mr. Black. Aye. And the chair is aye. And when it comes to thanks, um, I also want to thank you, Adam, for all of your leadership this year um, in the Highway Commercial One project. Um, if, it, if I had had to lead that effort, I, don't, I honestly don't think I could have been up to it. It was so hard and you did it and you did it with 82% of the vote. Very, very impressive and a good job. And also Natasha, now you're on our board but you contributed so much to that effort. Absolutely. And now we really appreciate everything you did for that project. Thank you. Absolutely, and encourage. So um, I, I was glad of the opportunity to serve as chair. Um, um, and this may be my last uh, uh, opportunity to serve as chair. I think I have three more years on the board, so we'll see. Um, um, but uh, as I step down, I'd also like to, to thank all of our staff people. This has been a difficult year with these Zoom meetings. I, th I don't think, I think no matter who was chair, um, that person would have had a challenge um, coping with the, the formality that you have to introduce, the, you know, the difficulty of really seeing that the other person wants to speak because you can't quite see the body language. It's not easy. Um, and we couldn't have done it without our, our wonderful staff. I mean, Lee Newman, our director, I mean, director is the right word in a way, you know, like she just keeps, she has, is so on top of everything that you know that you're, you, you know, you don't have to lie awake at night thinking you're forgetting something important. Lee, you're just been a wonderful, wonderful Lee, Lee, planning Lee's director. Lee's lies awake at night. <laughs> That's no. what I was just thinking too. Is Leo what? has to wake at night knowing that we've forgotten something. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and Alex, uh, you know, Alex puts together everything for us and keeps us in communication, and is just always there for us. And um, and Clay coming in and helping us with the tech support. Uh, we just you just know you know you know how stressful it can be if you're technology falls apart in a meeting. Um, and we didn't have to worry about that at all for both with, with Alex and Clay. And also their, uh, Alex's contribution, particularly to when we have hearings, making sure that the people who wanna speak are recognized and brought in. And you know, that's not easy in these Zoom meetings. So we did it, we did it with this team. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Well, hopefully. Thank you for a wonderful year. And as vice chair, I had a lot of fun working with you. I truly enjoyed it. Thank you, Paul. And I enjoyed working with Eugene. And hopefully on Friday we'll get some good news about when, you know, what new what the new normal is going to look like and what the timeline is to getting us there. Mm -hmm. I look forward to a meeting again in our meeting room on uh, Dunham Avenue. So maybe before too long. So July, I'll be back from Colorado in July. Will we meet in the meeting room in July? Oh boy. <laughs> I don't, I'll, I'll, I'll keep you posted. I, you might right. be meeting in the meeting room in June. <laughs> maybe, maybe. Okay, well, is it time to adjourn? Don't I move. move to adjourn. Second. Yes. Okay. Uh, motion is second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, we stand adjourned. Aye. Bye. Thank you, Thank you all. all.